Hercules Victus from Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels by St. John Hadkin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Alcestis how admetus was saved from the disagreeable necessity of dying by his wife alcestis who was permitted to die in his stead and how heracles in gratitude for admetus's hospitality wrestled with death for her and restored her to her husband has been narrated by euripides what euripides did not do was to give us any hint of the subsequent history of the reunited couple did they live happily ever afterwards or but the sequel must show it is written in the woman-hating vein so often seen in euripides and its title has been latinized for the benefit of those who have forgotten their greek dramatis personae admetus read by todd first semi-chorus read by elizabeth clett second semi-chorus read by charlotte duckett alcestis read by libby gone Heracles, read by Algy Pug. Narrated by Capricia Page. Scene. Before Admetus's palace, that worthy enters hurriedly through the royal doors, which he bangs behind him with a slight want of dignity. He soliloquizes. Ye gods, how long must I endure all this, the ceaseless clamor of a woman's tongue? Was it for this ye granted me the boon that she might give her life in place of mine? Only that Heracles might bring her back, torn from the arms of death, to plague me thus? This was your boon, in sooth no boon to me. How blind is man, not knowing when he is blessed. Fool that I was, I mourned Alcestia's death almost as much as I should mourn my own. Indeed, I thought, so great my grief appeared, I would almost have laid my own life down, almost, I say, to bring her back to earth. Yet, now she lives once more, she makes me weep more bitter tears than I ever did shed when I believed her gone beyond recall. <laughs> Weeps bitterly. Oh, what a doubtful blessing is a wife who saves your life, and then doth make it doubly hard to live. Alas, she doth but give a gift we cannot prize, but count it in our eyes as nothing worth, a thing to spurn, to cast away, to form the theme of this depreciatory lay. Alcestis, what a shame to find so kingly mind, so much disturbed, this kingly heart so wrung, by thy too active tongue. Thou gavest thy life for his, and oh, how wrong it is, to make that life which thou so nobly didst restore, a thing he values not at all, in fact a bore. O oh, wretched race of men, when shall we see again the peace that once ye had, ere woman bad, or mad, did cross your happy path in wrath, and doom you to a tedious life of fear and fret? Of unavailing tears and unconcealed regret. O oh, Heracles, what shame shall cloud your previous fame, Who brought this lady back along the black steep track, Where death and she did fare a pair, At least as we can ascertain content, To those Tartarian halls, to hear no arguments. Enter Alcestis. She is in a bad temper and is weeping as only Euripides' character can. Ah, woe is me! Why was I ever born? And why, once dead, did I return again to this distressful earth? O oh, Heracles, why did you bear me back to this sad place, this palace where Admeta sits enthroned? Oh, what a disagreeable fate it is to live with such a husband, hear his voice raised ever in complaint, and have no word of gratitude for all I did for him. Was there another creature in all the world who willingly would die for such a man? Not one. His father, aged though he was, scouted the proposition as absurd. His mother, when approached, declined in terms which I should hesitate to reproduce, so frank and so unflattering they were. But I, 
I gave my life instead of his, and what is my reward? A few cold words of thanks, a complimentary phrase or two, and then he drops the subject, thinks no more about the matter, and is quite annoyed, when, as may happen once or twice a day, I accidentally allude to it. Admetus, bursting into indignant stigmuthia. Not once or twice, but fifty times a day. Nay, you can't have too much of a good thing. I don't agree. Speech is a good to men. Your drift as yet I do not well perceive. Yet too much speech is an undoubted ill. Ah, you rail ever at a woman's tongue. Where the cap fits, why, let it there be worn. You spoke not thus when I redeemed your life. No, for I thought you gone ne'er to return. Twas not of my own will that I came back. I'm very certain that twas not of mine. Tell that to Heracles who rescued me. I will, next time he comes to stay with us. You say that knowing that he cannot come. Why should he not? What keeps him then away? Cleansing Algian's stables, a good work. Idiot, he never will let well alone. Alcestis, tired of only getting in one line at a time. You, you, what thankless things are men, and most of all how thankless husbands are. We cook their dinners, sew their buttons on, and even on occasion darn their socks, and they repay us thus. But see where comes great Heracles himself. Tis ever thus with heroes, mention them, and they appear. Enter Heracles, in the opportune manner customary in Greek tragedy. Preparing to salute the gods at great length. Great Zeus, and thou Apollo, and thou too. Interrupting hurriedly. O oh, Heracles, you come in fitting time to this afflicted and much suffering house. Wherefore afflicted? Anybody dead? Not dead, but living. That the grievance is. A plague on riddles. Make your meaning clear. Six months. Six little months, six drops of time. You still remain unwontedly obscure. Six months ago you tore my wife from death. Well, what of that? What's all the fuss about? I know you did it, meaning to be kind. But, oh, it was a terrible mistake. Indeed, I think it positively wrong that you should interfere with nature's laws in this extremely inconsiderate way. Depend upon it, when a lady dies, it's most unwise to call her back again. You should have left Alcestis to the shades, and me to live a happy widower. Ungrateful man, what words are these you speak? Were you not glad when I did bring her back? I was, but that was several months ago, and in the interval I have found cause, a dozen times a day, to change my mind. What cause so strong that you should wish her dead? Well, if you must be told, she's sadly changed. Dying has not at all agreed with her. Before death took her, she was kind and mild, as good a wife as any man could wish. How altered is her disposition now? She scolds the servants, sends away the cook, a man I've had in my employ for years, and actually criticizes me! I'm really very much distressed to hear this mournful news. But what am I to do? Make death receive her back. An easy task. But will our kiss to see it, do you think? Please don't distress yourself on her account. She'd leave her husband upon any terms. Is there a woman in the whole wide world that would not rather die a dozen times rather than live her life out with this man, this puling, miserable, craven thing who lets his wife lay down her life for him, and, when by miracle she is restored to earth again and claims his gratitude, has the bad taste to grumble at the fact? I told you, Heracles, she had a tongue. Indeed, she's well equipped in that respect. To such a man the stones themselves would speak. Well, lady, are you then content to die? I'm positively anxious to be off. Then will I go and make death take you hence? I'm sure I shall be very much obliged. But, oh, not half so much obliged as I. So be it then. Death would be far away. 
and when I've found him and have punched his head, I'll make him come and take you off at once. Exit Heracles. The chorus who appear to have borrowed their meter from Atalanta and Caledon sing as follows. Is, is this really, really to put, put an end, end to our, our cares, cares, to the to toils, our toils where our foot was, was caught, caught unawares? Will Heracles really, really put straight this unfortunate state of affairs? Will he overthrow death for the for second, second time here? Will he do as he as saith, he saith and in, in due time, time appear with the news which will lay fair Alcestis a second, second time out on her bier? She, she will die, she, she proclaims, with the utmost good will. And she calls us all names, in a voice that is shrill, while she vows that the sight of Admetus, her husband, is making her ill. It hardly seems wise to spurn and reject your husband with cries, to which all men object. But Admetus is scarcely the husband to inspire any wife with respect. Lo, Heracles comes, a hero confessed, but he twiddles his thumbs and looks somewhat depressed. Can, can it be, be that at last he's been conquered? conquered? Well, well, all I can say is, I'm blessed. The chorus sit down in dejection. Enter Heracles. First I salute the gods, great Zeus in chief. Interrupting. Oh, skip all that. Tell us about the fight. Yo, yo. Don't yap like that. Speak up. What is your news? My friends, I saw death slinking down the drive. I stopped him, told him that this lady here was anxious for his escort to the shades, reminded him that I had once before rescued her from his grasp, and pointed out how generous I was thus to restore what then I took. In fact, I put the best complexion on the matter that I could. Well, did he say that he would take me back? By no means. He declined emphatically. He would not take you upon any terms. Death is no fool. He knows what he's about. But did you not compel him to consent? I did my best. We had a bout or two of wrestling, but he threw me every time. Finally, out of breath, and sadly mulled, I ran away. And here I am, in fact. You stupid, clumsy, fat, degenerate lout! I positively hate the sight of you! Out of my way, or I shall scratch your face! If Dejanira feels at all like me, she'll borrow Nessa's shirt and make you smart. Exit angrily. Oh, what a vixen! Can you wonder death, when I approached him, would not take her back? I can't pretend I'm very much surprised. Although, if you will pardon the remark... I think you might have made a better fight. Better not stay to dine. It's hardly safe. Alcestis isn't to be trifled with. And if she murdered you, I should be blamed. Exit sorrowfully. Chorus rising fussily. How, How ill-natured of death. death! What, what a, a horrible, horrible thing. thing! It quite, quite takes my breath, breath and, and I, I pant as I sing. If Alcestis is really, really immortal. immortal. What, what a, a terrible, terrible blow for the, for the king. king. Curtain End of Hercules Victus The New Wing at Elsinore From Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels By St. John Hankin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox Dot org. Hamlet Among the plays which seem specially to require a sequel, Hamlet must certainly be reckoned. The end of Act V left the distracted kingdom of Denmark bereft alike of king, queen, and heir presumptive. There were thus all the materials for an acute political crisis. It might have been imagined that the crown would fall inevitably to the Norwegian Prince Fortinbras who, being on the spot with an army behind him, certainly seems to have neglected his chances. It is clear, however, from the sequel, that Fortinbras failed to rise to the occasion, and that Horatio, being more an antique Roman than a Dane, seized his opportunity, and by a coup d'état got possession of the vacant throne. 
nor would Fortinbras appear to have resented this, as we find him subsequently visiting Horatio at Elsinore. There is, however, a nemesis which waits upon usurpers, as the sequel shows. The sequel, by the way, should have been called Ghosts, but that title has already been appropriated by a lesser dramatist. Dramatis Personae Fortinbras Read by Alan Mapstone Horatio Read by Grace Garrett Ghost Read by Algie Pug First Clown Read by Eden Ray Hedrick Second Clown Read by Lambda And narrated by Elizabeth Clatt Scene One The platform before the old part of the castle as in Act One Horatio and Fortinbras come out of the house swathed in overcoats, the former looking nervously over his shoulder. It is a dark winter's evening after dinner. Fortinbras, shivering slightly. "'Tis bitter cold. And you are sick at heart, I know. The fact is, when I get a cold, I often can't get rid of it for weeks. I really think we may as well stay in. I'm sorry, but I can't agree with you. I shall sit here. Sits down resolutely with his back to the castle. Fortinbras, turning up his coat-collar resignedly. It's perfect rot, you know, to let yourself be frightened by a ghost. A ghost? You're always so inaccurate. Nobody minds a spectre at the feast less than Horatio. But a dozen spectres, all sitting round your hospitable board and clamouring for dinner, a sight no one can bear with equanimity. Of course, I know it's different for you. You don't believe in ghosts. Ah! What was that? Nothing. I'm sure I saw a figure moving there. Absurd. It's far too dark to see at all. After all, what are ghosts? In the most high and palmy state of Rome, a little ere the mightiest Julius fell, people saw hordes of them. Just ring for lights. Let us make ourselves as comfortable as this inclement atmosphere permits. I'd ring with pleasure if I thought the bell had any prospect of being answered. But there's not a servant in the house. No servants? As my genial friend Macbeth would probably have put it, not a maid is left this vault to brag of. In other words, they left en masse this morning. Dash it all! Something is rotten in the state of Denmark when you, its reigning monarch, cannot keep your servants for a week. Ah, Fortinbras, if you inhabited a haunted castle you'd find your servants would give warning too. It's not as if we only had one ghost, they simply swarm. Ticking them off on his fingers. There's Hamlet's father. He walks the battlements from ten to five. You'll see him here in half an hour or so. Claudius, the late king, haunts the state apartments. The queen the keep, Ophelia the moat, and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern the hall. Polonius you will usually find behind the air is murmuring platitudes, and Hamlet stalking in the corridors. Alas, poor ghost, his fatal indecision pursues him still. He can't make up his mind which rooms to take. You're never safe from him. But why object to meeting Hamlet's ghost? I've heard he was a most accomplished prince, a trifle fat and scant of breath, perhaps. But then, a disembodied Hamlet would doubtless show a gratifying change in that respect. I tell you, Fortinbras, it's not at all a theme for joking. However, when the new wing's finished, I shall move in, and all the ghosts in limbo may settle here as far as I'm concerned. When will that be? The architect declares he'll have the roof on by the end of March. Fortinbras, rising briskly. It is a nipping and an eager air. Suppose we stroll and see it. Horatio, rising also. With all my heart. Indeed, I think we'd better go at once. Looks at watch. The ghost of Hamlet's father's almost due. His morbid love of punctuality makes him arrive upon the stroke of ten, and as the castle clock is always fast, he's rather apt to be before his time. The clock begins to strike as they exeunt hastily. On the last stroke, ghost enters. I am Hamlet's father's spirit, doomed for a certain time to walk the night and for the day. Stops, seeing no one there. What? Nobody about? Why, this is positively disrespectful. I'll wait until Horatio returns, and when I've got him quietly alone, I will, a tale unfold, will make him jump sits down resolutely to wait for Horatio. Scene two, Before the new wing of the castle. The two clowns, 
formerly gravediggers, but now employed with equal appropriateness as builders, are working on the structure in the extremely leisurely fashion to be expected of artisans who are not members of a trades union. First Clown, in his best Elizabethan manner. Nay, but hear you, Goodman Builder. Second Clown, in homely vernacular. Look here, Bill. You can drop that jargon. There is no one here but ourselves, and I ain't amused by it. It's all very well to try it on when there is gentlefolk about. But when we are alone, you take a rest. Ay, Mary. Second Clown, throwing down tools. Stow it, I say, or I will have to make you. Marry, indeed. If you mean yes, say yes. If you mean no, say no. All right, mate. It's bad enough staying up all night, building more rooms onto this confounded castle. I should have thought it was big enough and ugly enough without our additions. But I am to listen to your gaps. Help me. Hush, here comes someone. They make a valiant pretense of work as Horatio and Fortinbras enter. Horatio, ecstatically, completely deceived by this simple ruse. My master builders. Idle dogs. Argal, goodman builder, will he nil he, he that builds not ill builds well, he that builds not well builds ill, therefore prepend. How absolute the knave is. He seems to me to be an absolute fool. Not at all a most intelligent working man. I'll draw him out. When will the house be finished, sirrah? When it is done, sir. Ay, fool, and when will that be? When it is finished, of course. There, what do you call that, Whittier? I call it perfectly idiotic, if you ask me. Well, well, we'll try again. And whose is the house, fellow? Mary, his that owns it. Ask another. Ha! Ha! Good again! By the Lord Fortinbras, as Hamlet used to say, the toe of the peasant comes so near the heel of the courtier it galls his kibe. The toe of the courtier is getting so perilously near the person of the peasant, you'd better get rid of the latter as soon as possible. Uh, perhaps you're right. And yet I was always taught to consider that kind of thing awfully entertaining. But there, fashions change in humour as well as other things. Send them away. Fortinbras giving them money. Away with you, fellows. Go and get drunk. Exeunt clowns. Horatio relapses into blank verse on their departure. What think you of the new wing, Fortinbras? The whole effect is cheerful, is it not? Good large sash windows, lots of light and air, no medieval nonsense. Fortinbras, who does not admire the building. So I see. No ghosts here, eh? To stalk about the rooms and fade against the crowing of the cock? Probably not. And yet, look there, Horatio. There's something in the shadow over there, moving towards the house. It's going in. Stop it, Horatio. Here, I can't stand this. I'll cross it though it blast me. Stay, illusion. The figure stops. Are you aware, sir, that you are trespassing? This is a private house. My private house. Oh, come, you know, you can't mean that. Your house, considering that I am building it myself, of course, assisted by an architect, I think you must admit there's some mistake. Ghost, turning and advancing towards them. Oh, what do I care for your architect? It's mine, I see, my house, my plot, my play. I made them all. Oh, my prophetic soul, Shakespeare. The same. I say, confound it all, do you propose to haunt the castle too? Yes, the new wing. It's really much too bad. You've filled the old part of the house with spectres. I think you might have left the new to me. That seems a reasonable compromise. I shall stay here. Make up your mind to that. But if you would like to share the wing with me, I've no objection. Thanks, I'd rather not. I shall consult with my solicitor, and if he can't eject you from the place, I'll sell it, ghosts and all. Come, Fortinbras. Exit with dignity. Curtain End of the New Wing at Elsinore by St. John Hankin More Ado About Nothing From Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels by St. John Hankin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org 
Much Ado About Nothing the end of much ado about nothing must always leave the sympathetic playgoer in tears the future looks black for everybody concerned claudio's jealous disposition will make him a most uncomfortable husband for the resuscitated hero while benedick and beatrice are likely to find that a common taste in badinage is not the most satisfactory basis for matrimony when it is added that don john's genius for plotting is sure in the end to get him into trouble one feels that nothing can be gloomier than the prospects of the entire cast dramatis personae beatrice read by elizabeth clatt benedick read by algy pug page read by todd don pedro read by grace garrett narrator read by ruth golding scene the garden of benedick's house at padua benedick is sitting on a garden seat sunning himself indolently beatrice is beside him keeping up her reputation for conversational brilliancy by a series of sprightly witticisms very likely i do talk twice as much as i should but then if i talk too much you certainly listen far too little so we are quits do you hear opening his eyes slowly eh? i believe you were asleep but there it is a great compliment to my wit like orpheus i can put even the savage beasts to sleep with it benedict's eyes close again and he appears to sink into a profound doze but if the beasts go to sleep there is no use in being witty I suppose Orpheus never thought of that. Come, wake up, good Signor Beast. Prods him coquettishly with her finger. Have you forgotten that the Duke is coming? When will he be here? Ere you have done gaping. Terribly bored by this badinage. Oh, my dear, if you'll only occasionally answer a plain question, when do you expect him? Skittish to the last plain questions should only be answered by plain people yawning heartily oh a pretty question then pretty questions should only be asked by pretty people there what do you think of that for wit really my dear i can hardly trust myself to characterize it in a uh, um, fitting terms rings bell enter page when is the duke expected in half an hour sir thank you exit page pouting you needn't have rung i could have told you that i am sure you could my dear but as you wouldn't i was going to if you had given me time experience has taught me my dear beatrice that it is usually much quicker to ring closes his eyes again how rude you are half opening them eh? i said it was very rude of you to go to sleep when i am talking closing his eyes afresh oh, it's perfectly absurd of you to talk when i'm going to sleep girding herself for fresh witticisms why absurd because i don't hear what you say of course my love whose repartees have been scattered for the moment by this adroit compliment well well sleep your fill bear i'll go and bandy epigrams with ursula exit beatrice benedick looks cautiously round to see if she is really gone and then heaves a sigh of relief poor beatrice if only she were not so incorrigibly sprightly she positively drives one to subterfuge produces a book from his pocket which he reads with every appearance of being entirely awake enter don pedro as from a journey benedick does not see him signor benedick starting up on hearing his name ah my dear lord welcome to padua looks him up and down but how's this you look but poorly my good benedick i am passing well my lord and your wife the fair beatrice as witty as ever quite rubbing his hands i felt sure of it i made the match remember i said to old leonato she were an excellent match for benedick as soon as i saw her so you did so you did i'm bound to say you don't seem particularly happy 
Oh, we get on well enough. Well enough? <laughs> Why, what's the matter, man? Come, be frank with me. My dear lord, never marry a witty wife. If you do, you'll repent it. But it's a painful subject. Let's talk of something else. How's Claudio? I thought we should see him, and Hero with you. Looking slightly uncomfortable. Claudio is, er, uh, fairly well. Why, what's the matter with him? His wife isn't developing into a wit, is she? No, she's certainly not doing that. Happy, Claudio. But why aren't they here, then? <clears throat> well, the truth is, Claudio's marriage hasn't been exactly one of my successes. You remember that I made that match, too. I remember. Didn't they hit it off? It was all Claudio's suspicious temper. He never would disabuse his mind of the idea that Hero was making love to somebody else. You remember he began that even before he was married. First it was me he suspected. Then it was the mysterious man under her balcony. You suspected him, too. Uh, that's true. But that was all my brother John's fault. Anyhow, I thought when they were once married things would settle down comfortably. You were curiously sanguine. I should have thought any one would have seen that after that scene in the church they would never be happy together. Perhaps so. Anyhow, they weren't. Of course, everything was against them. What with my brother John's absolute genius for hatching plots, and my utter inability to detect them, not to mention Claudio's unfortunate propensity for overhearing conversations and misunderstanding them, the intervals of harmony between them were extremely few, and at last Hero lost patience and divorced him. So bad as that? How did it happen? Oh, in the old way. My brother pretended that Hero was unfaithful, and as he could produce no evidence of the fact whatever, of course Claudio believed him. So, with his old passion for making scenes, he selected the moment when I and a half-dozen others were staying at the house, and denounced her before us all after dinner. The church scene, over again? No, it took place in the drawing-room. Hero behaved with her usual dignity, declined to discuss Claudio's accusations altogether, put the matter in the hands of her solicitor, and the decree was made absolute last week. She was perfectly innocent, of course. Completely. It was merely another ruse on the part of my amiable brother. Really, John's behaviour was inexcusable. Was Claudio greatly distressed when he found how he had been deceived? He was distracted. But Hero declined to have anything more to do with him. She said she could forgive a man for making a fool of himself once, but twice was too much of a good thing. Frowning. That sounds rather more epigrammatic than a really nice wife's remarks should be. She had great provocation. That's true, and one can see her point of view. It was the publicity of the thing that galled her, no doubt. But poor Claudio had no reticence whatever. That scene in the church was in the worst possible taste. But I forgot, you had a share in that. Stiffly. I don't think we need go into that question. And now to select the hour after a dinner party for taxing his wife with infidelity? How like Claudio! Really, he must be an absolute fool. Oh? Well, your marriage doesn't seem to have been a conspicuous success, if you come to that. That's no great credit to you, is it? You made the match. You said as much a moment ago. I know, I know. But seriously, my dear Benedict, what is wrong? Beatrice, of course. You don't suppose I'm wrong, do you? Come, that's better. A spark of the old, Benedict. Let me call your wife to you, and we'll have one of your old encounters of wit. Seriously alarmed. For heaven's sake, no. Ah, oh, my dear lord, if you only knew how weary I am of wit, especially Beatrice's wit. You surprise me. I remember I thought her a most amusing young lady. You weren't married to her. But what is it you complain of? Beatrice bores me. It is all very well to listen to sparkling sallies for ten minutes or so, but Beatrice sparkles for hours together. She is utterly incapable of answering the simplest question without a blaze of epigram. When I ask her what time it is, she becomes so insufferably facetious that all the clocks stop in disgust. And once, when I was thoughtless enough to inquire what there was for dinner, she made so many jokes on the subject that I had to go down without her. And even then the soup was cold. Quoting, Here you may see Benedict, the married man. Don't you try to be funny, too. One joker in a household is quite enough, I can tell you. 
and poor Beatrice's jokes aren't always in the best of taste, either. The other day, when the vicar came to lunch, he was so shocked at her that he left before the meal was half over, and his wife has never called since. My poor Benedict, I wish I could advise you, but I really don't know what to suggest. My brother could have helped you, I'm sure. He was always so good at intrigue. But unfortunately I had him executed after his last exploit with Claudio. It's most unlucky, but that's the worst of making away with a villain. You never know when you may need him. Poor John could always be depended upon in an emergency of this kind. He is certainly a great loss. Don't you think you could arrange it so that Beatrice should overhear you making love to someone else? We've tried that sort of thing more than once in this play. As the result has invariably been disastrous, I think we may dismiss that expedient from our minds. No, there's nothing for it but to put up with the infliction, and by practising a habit of mental abstraction reduce the evil to within bearable limits. I don't think I quite follow you. In plain English, my dear lord, I find the only way to go on living with Beatrice is never to listen to her. As soon as she begins to be witty, I fall into a kind of swoon, and in that comatose condition I can live through perfect coruscations of brilliancy without inconvenience. Does she like that? Candidly, I don't think she does. Hold! I have an idea. I hope not. Your ideas have been singularly unfortunate hitherto in my affairs. Ah, but you'll approve of this. What is it? Leave your wife and come away with me. She'd come after us. Yes, but we should have the start. That's true. By Jove, I'll do it. Let's go at once. Rises hastily. I think you ought to leave some kind of message for her. Just to say goodbye, you know. It seems more polite. Perhaps so. Tears leaf out of pocket book. What shall it be, prose or verse? I remember Claudio burst into poetry when he was taking leave of Hero. Such bad poetry, too. I think you might make it in verse. As you're leaving her forever, it seems more in keeping with the solemnity of the occasion. So it does. Writes. Bored to death by Beatrice's tongue, was the hero that lived here. Hush! Isn't that your wife over there in the arbour? Losing his temper. Dash it all! There's nothing but eavesdropping in this play. Perhaps she doesn't see us. Let's steal off anyhow on the chance. They creep off on tiptoe right, as Beatrice enters with similar caution left. Watching them go. Bother! I thought I should overhear what they were saying. I believe Benedict is really running away. It's just as well. If he hadn't, I should. He had really grown too dull for anything. Sees note which Benedict has left. Ah, so he's left a message. Farewell forever, I suppose. Reads it, stamps her foot. Monster! If I ever see him again, I'll scratch him. Curtain End of More Ado About Nothing The Other Critics from Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels by St. John Hankin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Critic Everybody who has seen the critic must have been filled with curiosity to read the press notices on Mr. Puff's tragedy, The Spanish Armada. The following sequel to Sheridan's comedy embodies some of these. Dramatis Personae, Sir Fretful Plagiary, read by Alan Mapstone. Mr. Dangle, read by Bala. Sneer, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Mrs. Dangle, read by Capricia Page. Servant, read by Charlotte Duckett. Puff, read by Bala. Narrator, read by Ruth Golding. Scene, Dangle's house. Mr. and Mrs. Dangle, sneer and Sir Fretful plagiary, discovered discussing the first performance of Puff's play, which has taken place a week previously. A table is littered with press cuttings dealing with the event, supplied by the indispensable Romica. I give you my word. The jewel scene was taken wholly from my comedy, 
the lover is abandoned pilfered egad bless my soul you don't say so and tilburina's speech about the finches of the grove twas i first thought of finches in my tragedy antonius but i can't believe my friend puff can i borrow deliberately from you sir fretful no one could possibly believe that eh it must have been a coincidence coincidence egad madam twas sheer theft and that use of the white handkerchief stolen bodily on my conscience coincidence dangle judicially it may be so though he is my friend maybe so it is so zounds dangle i take it very ill that you should have any doubt at all about the matter dangle hedging the resemblances are certainly very marked though he is my friend but will you hear what the critics say about it turning nervously to pile of press cuttings do they say anything about his indebtedness to me not a word i dare be sworn then i don't want to hear them none of the rogues know their business but they are very severe on the play are they there's something in the fellows after all pray read us some of the notices shall i begin with the times tis very satirical and as full of quotations as the pudding is of plums i know the style a vocabulary recruited from all the dead and living languages tis the very babble of dramatic criticism begin dangle dangle reading the philosopher who found in thought the proof of existence crystallized his theory in the phrase cogito ergo sum i think therefore i exist in this he found the explanation of what hugo called the neon geon the theory of the author of the spanish armada on the contrary seems to be sum ergo non cogitabo i exist therefore i need not think ha ha very good e faith dangle continuing la cita onis pranza the audience murmurs with dante as three mortal hours pass and mr puff is still prosing nor has he any dramatic novelty to offer us the scene affair is on conventional lines the boards are hoar with the nages to anton there is the anion rosus desiderated by aristotle and the hanapi ending required by the elizabethans the inevitable peripatia you know mr dangle i don't understand a single word you are reading nor i upon my soul it is certainly somewhat difficult shall i omit a few sentences and go on again where the allusions are less obscure reads half aloud to himself knitting his brows in the effort to understand what it is all about no trace of heinz welschmers capo espada niches ubermensch necorum pioros petrarch's immortal io ti amo the kind of the jardiner is elie de mon pere really mr dangle if you could find nothing more intelligible to read than that farrago of jargon i shall go away pray read us something in english for a change much relieved selecting another cutting here is the daily telegraph a whole column not much english there i'll warrant dangle reading time was when the london playhouses had not been invaded by the coarse suggestiveness or the wild indelicacy of the norwegian stage when pater familias could still take his daughters to the theatre without a blush those days are past the master as his followers call him like a deadly upatri has spread his blighting influence over our stage morality shocked at the fare that is nightly set before her shuns the playhouse and vice asserts the scene once occupied by the manly and the true sneer who has been beating time hear hear in the good old days when macready zounds mr dangle don't you think we might leave macready out of the question i notice that when the daily telegraph mentions macready the reference never occupies less than a quarter of a column you might omit that part and take up the thread further on very well continuing 
it is impossible not to be astonished that a writer of mr puff's talent should break away from the noble traditions of shakespeare to follow in the footsteps of the scandinavian surely mr dangle we've all had that before dangle testily no not in the same words but the sense egad why will you interrupt you can't expect a writer for the penny press to have something new to say in every sentence how the plague is a dramatic critic who has nothing to say to fill a column if he is never to be allowed to repeat himself how indeed ah i remember when my play the indulgent husband was produced yawning oh, oh i think dangle you might leave the telegraph and try one of the weekly papers what does the world say as you will selecting a new cutting in his new play the spanish armada mr puff has set himself to deal with one of those problems of feminine psychology with which hibson hoffman and suderman and all the newer school of continental dramatists have made us familiar the problem is briefly this when filial duty becomes a woman one way and passion another which call should she obey should she set herself to live a her life in the modern phrase to realize her individuality and stand forth glad and free as gregor's well says or should she deny her ego bow to the old conventions accept the old shibboleths and surrender her love like nora like hedda till burina is a personality at war with its environment interrupting pray mr dangle did you not tell me the critics were all unfavourable to mr puff's play nearly all of them but if the other critics abuse the play you will always find the critic of the world will prize it tis the nature of the man and how does he know what the other fellows will say easily you see he writes only for a weekly paper and always reads what the others have said first then he takes the opposite view no wonder he's so often right dangle continuing in viscarandos we have the man of primary emotions only like solness he climbs no steeples like lubourg he may now and then be seen with vine leaves in his hair stop stop mr dangle surely there must be some mistake i don't remember that whiskerandos had anything in his hair he wore a helmet all the time dangle irritably metaphor madam metaphor continuing in lord burley we hear something of epic silence which is so tremendous in bookman egad mr dangle doesn't the fellow abuse the play at all dangle looking through the article i don't think he does then i'll hear no more of him what possible pleasure can there be in hearing criticism of other people's plays if they are favourable none whatever enter servant announcing mr puff dangle advancing to meet him with a smile of the warmest affability ha my dear friend we were reading the notice of your tragedy in the world tis extremely friendly and as a fretful remarked a moment since what pleasure can there be in reading the criticism of people's plays if they aren't favourable sir fretful is most obliging the telegraph was somewhat severe though eh mr puff tis very like you have not seen it let me read it for you searches eagerly in pile of cuttings indifferently i never look at unfavourable criticisms a wise precaution truly very it saves valuable time for if a notice is unfavourable i am always sure to have read it aloud to me by one d d good-natured friend or another curtain End of the Other Critics The Relapse of Lady Teasel from Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels by St. John Hankin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The School for Scandal the school for scandal ends it will be remembered with the reconciliation of sir peter and lady teasel the complete exposure of joseph surface and the rehabilitation of charles 
but how long did the teasel reconciliation last and if sir oliver surface left all his fortune to his nephew charles how long did that young gentleman take to run through it dramatis personae sir peter teasel read by algy pug lady teasel read by elizabeth clatt joseph surface read by m b sir oliver surface read by todd narrator read by ruth golding scene room in sir peter teasel's house sir peter and lady teasel discovered wrangling as in act two lady teasel lady teasel i'll not bear it sir peter sir peter you've told me that a hundred times this habit of repeating yourself is most distressing tis a sure sign of old age owns madam will you never be tired of flinging my age in my face lud sir peter tis you that fling it in mine how often have you said to me when an old bachelor marries a young wife and if i have lady teasel you needn't repeat it after me for you live only to plague me and yet twas but six months ago you vowed never to cross me again yes madam six months ago when i found you concealed behind a screen in mr surface's library you promised that if i would forgive you your future conduct should prove the sincerity of your repentance i forgave you madam and this is my reward and am i to blame sir peter for your ill humours must i always be making concessions to please you i have given up all routs and assemblies attend no balls nor quadrilles talk no scandal never ogle nor flirt i go no more to my lady sneerwell's though i vow hers was a most delightful house to visit such fashion and elegance such wit such delicate malice just so madam this is what i complain of all the while you are longing to return to these follies you are not happy when you are alone with me great heaven sir peter you must not ask for miracles what woman of fashion is ever happy alone with her husband there it is lady teasel you think only of fashion and yet when i married you oh oh lad sir peter why will you always be returning to that painful subject vastly painful no doubt madam since it prevents you from marrying mr surface behind whose screen i found you oh oh mr surface but twas charles you used to suspect and now tis joseph zounds madam is a man never to be allowed to change his mind i say tis joseph 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 enter joseph surface sir peter and lady teasel are obviously disconcerted at this inopportune arrival and say nothing joseph has greatly changed in appearance in the six months which have elapsed between the play and the sequel he has lost his sleekness and his air of conscious virtue and looks like a careless good-humoured man about town obviously enjoying their discomfort sir peter your servant lady teasel your most obedient bows profoundly to what mr surface do we owe the honour of this visit blandly correcting him pleasure sir peter i said honour sir i came at the invitation of sir oliver who is staying in your house he desired to see me viciously to sir peter if this gentleman's business is with sir oliver perhaps he will explain why he is intruded in this room with pleasure my attention was arrested by the sound of voices raised in dispute i heard my name mentioned loudly more than once and recognising one of the voices as that of lady teasel with a low bow i thought it better to interpose to defend my character at once stamping her foot insolent <laughs> very good if faith mr surface i could almost find it in my heart to forgive you for your injuries towards me when you talk like that injuries sir peter i never did you an injury that affair of the screen was the merest misunderstanding i had no desire at all to capture the affections of lady teasel 
on the contrary it would have been highly inconvenient for me it was your ward maria that i wished to win monster unhappily lady teasel mistook the nature of my attentions and i knowing her temper bowing to lady teasel feared to undeceive her lest she should use her influence to prejudice me in the eyes of your ward that sir peter is the true explanation of the situation in which you found lady teasel on that unlucky morning with suppressed fury pray sir peter do you propose to continue to permit this gentleman to speak of me in this way certainly madam everything that mr surface has said seems to me to bear the stamp of truth oh. so you see sir peter you never had any real cause of jealousy towards me my conduct was foolish i admit but it was never criminal joseph i believe you six months ago i thought you guilty of the basest treachery towards me but a year of marriage with lady teasel has convinced me that in her relations with you as in her relations with me it is always lady teasel who is in the wrong they shake hands warmly i will not stay here to be insulted in this manner i will go straight to lady sneerwell's and tear both your characters to tatters exit in a violent passion Oons, what a fury but when an old bachelor marries a young wife come come sir peter no sentiments what you say that my dear joseph this is indeed a reformation had it been charles now i should not have been surprised egad sir peter in the matter of sentiments charles for a long time had a most unfair advantage of me for having no character to lose he had no need of sentiments to support it but now i have as little character as he and we start fair now i am a free man i say what i think do what i please scandal has done its worst with me and i no longer fear it whereas when i had a character for morality to maintain all my time was wasted in trying to live up to it i had to conceal every trifling flirtation and had finally wrapped myself in such a web of falsehood that when your hand tore away the veil i give you my word i was almost grateful depend upon it sir peter there's no possession in the world so troublesome as a good reputation digging him in the ribs <laughs> ah joseph you're a sad dog but here comes your uncle sir oliver i'll leave him with you exit enter sir oliver reading a sheaf of legal documents reading eighty one hundred and twenty two hundred and twenty three hundred pounds gad the dog will ruin me sir oliver your servant looking up hey is that you nephew yes i remember i sent for you you're busy this morning uncle i'll wait upon you another day no no joseph stay and hear what i have to tell you i sent for you to say that i have decided to pardon your past misconduct and restore you to favor six months of charles's society have convinced me of the folly of adopting a reprobate i thought they would uncle your brother's extravagances pass all bounds here are four writs which were served upon him but yesterday and the fellow has the assurance to send them on to me joseph laughs heartily sounds nephew don't stand chuckling there and his character has not reformed one whit in spite of his promises his flirtations with my lady sneerwell and others are so excessive that maria has quite thrown him over and the engagement is broken off add to this that i have paid his debts three times only to find him contracting fresh liabilities and you may judge that my patience is exhausted but these are old stories uncle you knew that charles was vicious and extravagant when you made him your heir he's done nothing fresh to offend you on the contrary he has done something which has hurt me deeply how absurd of him uncle when he knows that he is dependent wholly on your bounty wait till you hear the whole story a week ago your brother came to me for money to meet some gambling debt i refused him whereupon he returned to his house had it an auctioneer and sold everything that it contained and did you play a little premium a second time uncle certainly not sir on this occasion i left the rogue to settle matters for himself but i see no great harm in this 
why should not charles sell his furniture deuce take his furniture he sold my picture what the ill-looking little fellow over the settee yes ha 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 delicious sold his uncle's portrait gad i like his spirit you seem vastly entertained nephew i confess the humour of this situation appeals to me happily for you i am less easily amused no no charles is a heartless scoundrel and i'll disown him no no uncle he's no worse than other young men but he sold my picture he was pressed for money but he sold my picture he meant no harm i'll be bound but he sold my picture enter sir peter hurriedly looking pale and disordered my dear sir peter you are ill you've had bad news sir peter old friend what is it uh, 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 lady teasel stops choked with passion not dead dead hell and furies if it were only that no run away with your profligate nephew charles impossible is this certain ay roly saw them driving together in a post-chaise towards richmond not ten minutes ago then i'll disown him joseph you are my heir but see that you behave yourself or i'll disinherit you too and leave my money to a missionary society curtain end of the relapse of lady teasel Still Stooping from Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels by St. John Hankin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. She Stoops to Conquer. Many people must have wondered whether happiness resulted from the marriage between Charles Marlowe, whose shyness with ladies, it will be remembered, prevented his ever having a word to say to any woman above the rank of a barmaid, and the vivacious Kate Hardcastle. The following sequel reveals the painful truth. Dramatis Personae Kate, recorded by Karen Savage Charles, recorded by Peter Yearsley Hardcastle, recorded by Sarah O'Connor the parlour of Charles Marlowe's house. He and Kate are sitting on opposite sides of the fire. Silence reigns, and Charles fidgets nervously. Kate, anticipating a remark subsequently made by Paula Tankery. Six minutes. Charles, finding his tongue with an effort. Uh, eh? Exactly six minutes, dear, since you made your last remark. Charles, laughing uneasily and blushing. Um, ah. Uh. <laughs> well, what are you going to say next? It's really time you made an observation of some kind, you know. Um, uh, I've nothing to say. Come, make an effort. It's, uh, a fine day. Considering that it's raining steadily, dear, and has been for the past half hour, I hardly think that can be considered a fortunate opening. Confound it! So it is. Forgive me, uh, my dear. I didn't know what I was saying. You very seldom do, dear, to me. What a fool you must think me. Kate, touched by his evident sincerity. Never mind. It's a shame to laugh at you. But you are rather absurd, you know. She goes over and kisses him. He accepts the caress with gratitude, but blushes painfully. I know, my love. But I've always been shy like that. It's an idiosyncrasy. Not idiosyncrasy, dear. Idiocy. The words are so much alike. Oh, now you're laughing at me. Of course I am, Goose. You see, dear, as long as you were a bachelor, it was all very well to be bashful. But now that we are married, I really think you ought to fight against it. Fight against it? I fight against it every hour of the day. Every morning I say to myself, I really must get over this ridiculous shyness. I must try and show Kate how much I, I uh, love her. You are curiously unsuccessful, dear. I feel that, but it's not for lack of trying. Do you suppose, Kate, that anything but the strongest effort of will keeps me sitting in this chair at this moment? Do I ever, save under compulsion, remain in the same room with any lady for more than five minutes 
why my dear girl if i didn't love you to distraction i shouldn't remain here an instant you certainly have a curious method of displaying an ardent attachment yes it's most unfortunate but i warned you dear didn't i i told you all about my absurd bashfulness before we became engaged you knew that the presence of ladies invariably reduced me to speechlessness before you accepted me not invariably my love what about your prowess with mrs mantrap and lady betty blackleg that you told me about charles blushes crimson didn't they call you their agreeable rattle at the ladies club in town i uh, get on well enough with um uh disreputable ladies but you uh, aren't disreputable you are too modest dear some of your conquests are quite respectable didn't i come upon you in the act of kissing anne the housemaid yesterday and no one can pretend that my housemaids are disreputable <sighs> yes i'm not shy with housemaids so i noticed i sent anne away this morning not anne yes and Sarah, too. I thought I detected in you a lurking penchant for Sarah. Yes, I liked Sarah. So now we haven't a single maid in the house. It's really very inconvenient. You must get others. For you to make eyes at? Certainly not. By the way, is there any type of female domestic servant whom you do not find irresistibly attractive? Dark ones? Fair ones? young ones old ones tall ones short ones he shakes his head at each question not one i'm afraid not then i must do the housework myself charming my dear kate how delightful put on a cap and apron and take a broom in your hand and my bashfulness will vanish at once i know it will it seems the only course open to us especially as there's no one else to sweep the rooms but I wish you were not so unfortunately constituted. So do I. But after all, we must accept facts and make the best of them. You stooped to conquer, you know. You must go on stooping. Go and put on an apron at once. Scene 2. Charles's special sitting room, where he is wont to hide his shyness from visitors. Time a week later. Kate in a print dress, cap and apron, is on her knees before the fireplace, cleaning up the hearth. Charles, entering the room unperceived, stealing up behind her and giving her a sounding kiss. Still stooping, Kate? Charles! Charles, kissing her again. Oh, Kate, Kate, what a charming little creature you are, and how much I love you. But how long will you go on loving me? always dearest in a cap and apron embraces her it's rather hard that i should have to remain a housemaid permanently in order to retain my husband's affection it is dear i see that however there's nothing to be done so i may as well accustom myself to the idea as soon as possible takes a broom and begins to sweep the floor you don't think your absurd shyness is likely to diminish with time it may dear but i think it would be unwise to count upon it no as far as i can see the only thing to be done is for you to continue in your present occupation you sweep charmingly for the rest of your natural life kate sweeping industriously what would my father say if he saw me he won't see you he hasn't been over since we were married a ring is heard who's that what does it matter no one will be shown in here jenkins has orders never to bring visitors into my room that's true returns to her sweeping suddenly the door opens and mr hardcastle enters with elaborate heartiness thrusting aside jenkins who vainly tries to keep him out zounds man out of the way don't talk to me about the parlour can't i come and see my son-in-law in any room i choose charles mutters an oath Kate stands, clutching her broom convulsively, facing her father. How do you do, son-in-law? Kate, my dear, give me a kiss. Heavens, child, don't stand there clinging to a broomstick as though you're going to fly away with it. Come and kiss your old father. Kate drops the broom nervously and kisses him obediently. 
Charles, endeavouring by the warmth of his welcome to divert attention from his wife, How do you do, sir? How do you do? wringing his hand. Hardcastle, noticing a small heap of dust on the carpet which has been collected by Kate's exertions, Eh, what's this? Why, I believe you are actually sweeping the room, Kate. I am sorry, father, that you should have found me so unsuitably employed. Unsuitably? On the contrary, nothing could be more suitable. Come, papa, don't you begin to be eccentric, too. I am not aware that there is anything eccentric about me. No, no, sir, of course not. But when I find my daughter laying aside her finery and looking after her house, I cannot conceal my satisfaction. Ah, Charles, you have improved her greatly. When she lived at home, you remember, I had hard enough work to persuade her to lay aside fine clothes and wear her housewife's dress in the evenings. As for sweeping, I never even ventured to suggest it. I should think not. And yet, Kate, if you knew how charming you look in a print frock, a cap and apron. Kate, laughing in spite of herself. You too? Really, Papa, I'm ashamed of you. However, you seem both of you determined that I should pass the remainder of my days as a housemaid, so I suppose you must have your way. This is what comes of stooping to conquer. Now go away, both of you, and leave me to finish sweeping. Takes up broom again resolutely. We will, Kate. Come, Charles. Coming, sir. Darting across to his wife and kissing her. Darling. Goose. He goes out hurriedly after Hardcastle. The End of Still Stooping In the Lion's Den from Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels by St. John Hankin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the Lady of Lyon. When Lord Lytton provided the conventional happy ending for the Lady of Lyon by reuniting Pauline, ne des Chapelles, to the devoted Claude Melnot, promoting the latter to the rank of colonel in the French army, he seems not to have troubled his head as to the divergent social ideas of the happy pair nor as to how the vulgar and purse-proud family of des chapelles and the humbler melnots would get on together the sequel throws a lurid light on these points in writing it great pains have been taken to make the blank verse wherever possible as bad as lord lytton's dramatis personae pauline melnot read by by amanda friday Claude Melnot, read by Lambda. James, manservant, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Mrs. Melnot, read by Karen Savage. Mrs. De Chapelle, read by Capricia Page. Narrator, read by Ruth Golding. In the Lion's Den. Scene: The drawing room of Claude Melnot's house. Pauline is sitting by the fire, Claude leaning with his back against the mantelpiece. James, a manservant in livery, enters with a card on a salver. Reading card. Mrs. Smith? Not at home, James. Who can never quite get out of his habit of speaking in blank verse. Why are you not at home to Mrs. Smith? My dear Claude, that woman... Mr. Smith kept a greengrocer's shop. Tis true he made a great deal of money by his contracts to supply the armies of the Republic with vegetables. But they are not gentle people. In his most Byronic manner. What is it makes a gentleman, Pauline? Is it to have a cousin in the peerage? Partly that, dear. Or is to be honest, simple, kind? But I have no reason for believing Mr. Smith to have been more honest than the general run of army contractors. Continuing. Gentle in speech and action as in name. Oh, it is this that makes a gentleman. And Mr. Smith, although he kept a shop, may very properly be so described. 
"'Yes, I know, dear. "'Everybody calls himself a gentleman nowadays. "'Even the boy who cleans the boots. "'But I'm not going to give in to these unhealthy, modern ideas. "'And I'm not going to visit Mrs. Smith. "'She is not in society.' off again on his high horse what is society all noble men but mr smith isn't a nobleman claude and women in whatever station born these only these make up society but that's such a dreadful misuse of words dear when one talks of society one does not mean good people or unselfish people or high-minded people, but people who keep a carriage and give dinner parties. Those are the only things which really matter socially. Pauline, Pauline, what dreadful sentiments! They show a worldly and perverted mind. I grieve to think my wife should utter them. I wish, Claude, you'd try and give up talking in blank verse. It's very bad form and it's a very bad verse too try and break yourself of it off again all noble thoughts pauline no 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 claude i really can't have this ranting byronics are quite out of fashion relapsing gloomily into prose you may laugh at me pauline but you know i am right of course you're right dear much too right for this wicked world that's why i never can take your advice on any subject you're so unpractical breaking out again the world the world oh how i hate this world now that's silly of you dear there's nothing like making the best of a bad thing by the way claude didn't you say mrs melnot was coming to call this afternoon yes dear mother how nice it'll be to see her again it will be charming of course i do hope no one else will call at the same time perhaps i'd better tell james we are not at home to any one except mrs melnot oh no don't do that my mother will enjoy meeting our friends no doubt dear but will our friends enjoy meeting your mother seeing him about to burst forth again oh yes claude i know what you are going to say but after all lyons is a very purse-proud vulgar place you know how my mother can behave on occasions and if mrs melnot happens to be here when other people call it might be very unpleasant i really think i had better say we are not at home to any one rises to ring the bell pauline i forbid you sit down at once if my family are not good enough for your friends let them drop us and be hanged to them claude don't storm it's so vulgar and there's not the least occasion for it either i only thought it would be pleasanter for all our visitors your dear mother among the number if we avoided all chance of disagreeable scenes but there dear you've no savoir faire and i'm afraid we shall never get into society it's very sad touched by her patience i am sorry my dear i ought to have kept my temper but i wish you weren't so set upon getting into society isn't it a little snobbish wilfully misunderstanding him it's dreadfully snobbish dear the most snobbish sort of society i know all provincial towns are like that but it's the only society there is here you know and we must make the best of it my poor pauline kissing her but you know claude social distinctions do exist why not recognize them and the late mr melnot was a gardener he was an excellent gardener one of the lower classes in a republic there are no lower classes in a republic there are no higher classes and class distinctions are more sharply drawn than ever in consequence so much the worse for the republic claude i begin to think you are an anarchist i i am a colonel in the french army but not a real colonel claude only a republican colonel 
i rose from the ranks in two years by merit i know dear real colonels only rise by interest claude gasps opening the door and showing in a wizened old lady in rusty black garments and a bonnet slightly awry mrs melnot pauline goes forward to greet her not seeing her ah my dear son runs across the room to claude before the eyes of the deeply scandalized james and kisses him repeatedly how glad i am to see you again and your grand house and your fine servants in livery too pauline shudders and so does james the latter goes out my dearest mother kisses her beaming on pauline how do you do my dear let me give my claude's wife a kiss does so in resounding fashion as soon as she has recovered from the warmth of this embrace how do you do mrs melnot won't you sit down thank you kindly my dear i don't mind if i do a ring is heard outside followed by the sound of someone being admitted pauline looks anxiously towards the door to herself a visitor how unlucky i wonder who it is throwing open the door a mrs de chapelle great heavens my mother falls back overwhelmed into her chair in her most elaborate manner my dear child you are unwell my coming has been a shock to you but there a daughter's affection claude shaking hands with him how wonderful it is dear mother we are delighted to see you of course i ought to have called before i have been meaning to come ever since you returned from your honeymoon but i have so many visits to pay and you have only been back ten weeks i quite understand mother dear and as i always say to your poor father when one is a leader in society one has so many engagements i am sure you find that i have hardly begun to receive visits yet no dear but then it's different for you when you married colonel melnot of course you gave up all social ambitions i am sure no one could wish for a better braver husband than my claude turning sharply round and observing mrs melnot for the first time i beg your pardon i said no one could have a better husband than claude dumbfounded appealing to pauline who who is this person i think you have met before mother this is mrs melnot oh the gardener's wife melodramatic at once yes the gardener's wife and my mother of course i know the unfortunate relationship between you claude you need not thrust it down my throat you know how unpleasant it is for me shocked at this bad taste mother oh yes it is as i was saying to your poor father yesterday of course claude is all right he is an officer now and all officers are supposed to be gentlemen but his relatives are impossible quite impossible this insolence is intolerable madame de Chappelle. claude claude don't be angry remember who she is i remember well enough she is madame de Chappelle, and her husband is a successful tradesman he was an english shop boy and his proper name was chapel he came over to france grew rich put a de before his name and now gives himself airs like the other parvenus monster my dear claude how wonderfully interesting rising my son you must not forget your manners mrs de chapelle is pauline's mother i will go away now and leave you to make your apologies to her claude tries to prevent her going no no i will go really good-bye my son good-bye dear pauline kisses her and goes out
if that woman imagines that i am going to stay here after being insulted by you as i have been she is much mistaken please ring for my carriage claude rings as for you pauline i always told you what would happen if you insisted on marrying beneath you and now you see i'm right you seem to forget mamma that papa was practically a bankrupt when i married and that claude paid his debts i forget nothing and i do not see that it makes the smallest difference i am not blaming your poor father for having his debts paid by colonel melnot i am blaming you for marrying him good-bye she sweeps out in a towering passion sit down claude and don't glower at me like that it's not my fault if mamma does not know how to behave struggling with his rage that's true that's true poor mamma her want of breeding is terrible i have always noticed it but that story about mr chapelle explains it all why didn't you tell it to me before i thought it would pain you pain me i am delighted with it why it explains everything it explains me it explains you even a miss chapelle might marry any one don't frown claude laugh we shall never get into society in lyons but at least we shall never have another visit from mamma the worst has happened we can now live happily ever afterwards Curtain. End of In the Lion's Den The Vengeance of Cast From Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels By St. John Hankin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org cast most people in their day have wept tears of relief at the ending of t w robertson's comedy cast when the hon george dalroy not dead poor chap falls into the arms of his wife esther while his father-in-law eccles bestows a drunken benediction upon him before starting for jersey and his sister-in-law polly and her adored plumber garage embraced sympathetically in the background in these circumstances it seems hardly kind to add a further act in this harrowing drama but the writer of sequels like nemesis is inexorable if the perusal of the following scene prevents any young subaltern from emulating daltroy and marrying a ballet dancer with a drunken father it will not have been written in vain Dramatis Personae Esther Dalroy Read by Amanda Friday George the Alroy Read by Lambda Maids Read by Charlotte Duckett Eccles Read by Todd Narrated by Capricia Page Scene The dining room of the Dalroy's house in the suburbs. Dinner is just over, and George Dalroy in a seedy coat and carpet slippers is sitting by the fire smoking a pipe on the other side of the fire sits esther his wife darning a sock tired george yes had a bad day in the city beastly i believe i am the unluckiest beggar in the world every stock i touch goes down why don't you give up speculating if you're so unlucky george hurt i don't speculate dear i invest why don't you give up investing then it makes a dreadful hole in our income one must do something for one's living esther sighing oh what a pity it is you left the army i had to the regiment wouldn't stand your father he was always coming to the mess room when he was drunk and asking for me so the colonel said i would better send in my papers esther gently not drunk george the colonel said so and he was rather a judge esther unable to improve upon her old phrase father is a very eccentric man 
but a very good man when you know him george grimly if you mean by eccentric a man who is always drunk and won't die he is most eccentric hush dear after all he's my father that's my objection to him i'm afraid you must have lost a great deal of money to-day pretty well but i have noticed that retired military men who go into the city invariably do lose money why do they go into the city then george gloomily why indeed there is a short pause george stares moodily at the fire i had a visit from your mother to-day how was she not very well she has aged sadly in the last few years her hair is quite white now george half to himself poor mother poor mother she was very kind she asked particularly after you and she saw little george gently i think she is getting more reconciled to our marriage do you really dear looks at her curiously yes and i think it's such a good thing how strange it is that people should attach such importance to class distinctions forgive me dear but if you think it strange that marcus de saumur does not consider mr eccles and the garages wholly desirable connections i am afraid i cannot agree with you of course papa is a very eccentric man my dear esther mr eccles made his hundred and fifty-sixth appearance in the police court last week the fact was made the subject of jocular comment in the cheaper evening papers the sentence was five shillings or seven days poor papa felt his position acutely not half so acutely as i did i paid the five shillings if he had only consented to remain in jersey but you know jersey didn't suit him he was never well there he was never sober there that was the only thing that was the matter with him no my love let us look at facts in the face you are my dear little woman but your father is detestable and there is not the smallest ground for hope that my mother will ever be reconciled to our marriage as long as she retains her reason i suppose father is rather a difficulty yes he and the garages between them have made us impossible socially what's the matter with the garages nothing except that you always ask them to all our dinner parties and as gentle people have a curious prejudice against sitting down to dinner with a plumber and a glazier it somewhat narrows our circle of acquaintance but sam isn't a working plumber now he has a shop of his own quite a large shop and their house is just as good as ours the furniture is better sam bought polly a new carpet for the drawing-room only last week it cost fourteen pounds and our drawing-room carpet is dreadfully shabby i am glad they are getting on so well with a flicker of hope do you think there is any chance as they grow more prosperous of their dropping us esther indignantly how can you think of such a thing george sighing i was afraid not esther enthusiastically why sam is as kind as can be and so is polly and you know how fond they are of little george poor child yes he has always played with their children ever since he could toddle and what is the result a cockney accent that is indescribable what does it matter about his accent so long as he is a good boy and grows up to be a good man ethically my dear not at all but practically it matters a great deal it causes me intense physical discomfort and i think it is killing my mother george moreover when the time comes for him to go to public school he will probably be very unhappy in consequence why merely irrational prejudice public school boys dislike all deviations from the normal and to them happily a pronounced cockney accent represents the height of abnormality esther sadly in spite of our marriage 
I'm afraid you're still a worshipper of caste. I thought you turned your back on all that when you married me. So I did, dear, so I did. But I don't want to commit my son to the same hazardous experiment. Ah, George, you don't really love me, or you wouldn't talk like that. My dear, I love you to distraction. That's exactly the difficulty. I am torn between my devotion to you and my abhorrence of your relations. When your father returned from Jersey and took a lodging close by us, nothing but the warmth of my affection prevented me from leaving you for ever. He is still here, and so am I. What greater proof could you have of the strength of my attachment? Poor father! He could not bear to be away from us, and he has grown so fond of little George. George shudders. Father has a good heart. I wish he had a stronger head. This remark is prompted by the sound of Mr. Eccles entering the front door and having a tipsy altercation with the maid. Maid announcing, Mr. Eccles. Eccles joyously. Hey, evening. Hick, hick, me children. Bless you, bless you. Good evening, father. Won't you hick, speak to your old father-in-law, Georgie? George says nothing. Ah, oh, pride, pride, cruel pride! You come before a fall, you do! Lurches heavily against the table, and subsides into a chair. Funny that! Almost <laughs> seemed as if that proverb was a coming true that time! George sternly. How often have I told you, Mr. Eccles, not to come to this house except when you're sober? Eccles, raising his voice in indignant protest. Sober? <laughs> Perfectly sober! Sober as a big judge! I am afraid I can't argue with you as to the precise stage of intoxication in which you find yourself. You had better go home at once. Do you hear that, Esther? Do you hear that, me child? Yes, father. I think you had better go home. You're not very well tonight. Eccles, rising unsteadily from his chair. All right, Esther. I'm going. Good night, Georgie. George, with the greatest politeness. Good night, Mr. Eccles. If you could possibly manage to fall down and damage yourself seriously on the way home, I should be infinitely obliged. Eccles begins to weep. There's words to address to a loving <gasps> father-in-law. There's words. Lurches out. I think, George, you had better see him home. It's not safe for him to be alone in that state. George, savagely. Safe? I don't want him to be safe. Nothing would give me greater satisfaction than to hear he had broken his neck. Esther, gently. But he might meet a policeman, George. Ha! Ah, that's another matter. Perhaps I would better see the beast into a cab. Esther, sighing. Ah, oh, you never understood, poor father. A crash is heard from the hall, as Eccles lurches heavily and upsets the hat-stand. George throws up his hand in despair at the wreck of the hall furniture, or perhaps at the obtuseness of his wife's last remark, and goes out to call a cab. Curtain End of The Vengeance of Cast Out of Patience or Bunthorn Avenged, from Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels by St. John Hankin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Patience, or Bunthorn's Bride at the end of patience it will be remembered the twenty lovesick maidens gave up aestheticism and decided to marry officers of dragoons but a taste for intellectual grim crackery is not so easily eradicated and it is probable that the poor ladies neither liked nor were liked at aldershot that is certainly the impression conveyed by the following sequel dramatis personae Chorus read by Ruth Golding. Sophia read by Capricia Page. Angela read 
by Amanda Friday. Ella, read by Libby Gone. Colonel Calverly, read by Todd. Major Murgatroyd, read by Alan Mapstone. Officers, read by Charlotte Duckett. Narrated by Capricia Page. Out of Patience or Bunthorn Avenged. Scene Drawing room of Colonel Calverley's house of Aldershot. His wife, Saffer, is entertaining Angela, Ella, and the rest of the love sick maidens, now married to stalwart officers of dragoons, at afternoon tea. Each lady dandles a baby, which squalls intermittently. Twenty, Twenty heart sick ladies, ladies we, living, living down, down at Aldershot. Aldershot every morning fervently wishing wishing we were not twenty married ladies we and our fate we may not alter if we dare to mutiny they will send us to gibraltar the babies appalled at this prospect howl unanimously sophia as soon as she can make herself heard our mornings go instilling babies squalls ah oh, misery our afternoons in paying tiresome calls and, and drinking, drinking tea. tea and then those long long regimental balls on we on we and after a time that sort of pleasure palls as you may see <sighs> all yawn including the babies twenty heart sick ladies we living down at aldershot every morning fervently Wishing, wishing, wishing we, we were not. Twenty married ladies we, and our fate we may not alter. If we dare to mutiny, they will send us to Gibraltar. Angela sighs. Oh, it's a dreadful thing that we should all have married officers in the army. And all have to live at Aldershot. All except Lady Jane. But she married a duke. I don't see why that should make any difference. You wouldn't expect a duchess to live in the provinces. She couldn't be spared. What do you mean? No duchess is allowed to be out of London during the season. There are hardly enough of them to go round as it is. I never imagined that when we married we should find ourselves so completely out of it. All indignantly. Out, out of, of it. it? Yes, out of it. Out of the world, the fashion, what you please. Aestheticism is out of vogue now, of course, but there have been lots of fascinating movements since then. There's been Isbin, and the Revolt of Daughters, and Aubrey Beardsley and the Decadents, and the Matterlink. The world has been through all these wonderfully thrilling phases since 1880. And where are we? Angela remonstrating. We read about them in the ladies' papers. Read about them? What's the good of reading about them? I want to be in them. I want to live my life. Shakes her baby fiercely. It raises a howl. Ella rushing to the rescue. Take care, take care, poor darling. It'll have a fit. Take it, then. Throws it to Ella. I'm tired of it. What's the good of buying a complete set of back numbers of the yellow book and reading them, too? general astonishment at this feat if you can't even shake your baby without making it squall i'd never have married colonel calverley if i'd have thought of that nor i major murgatroyd sings when first i consented to wed i said i shall never come down to passing my life as an officer's wife in a second-rate garrison town i said i shall live in mayfair with plenty of money to spare have admirers and flocks, wear adorable frocks, and diamonds everywhere. Yes, that's what I certainly said when first I consented to wed. I thought, on the day I was wed, I could reckon with perfect propriety on filling a place with conspicuous grace in the smartest of London society. I said, it is easy to see, I shall be at the top of the tree, and none of the millions of vulgar civilians will venture to patronize me yes that's what i foolishly said when first i consented to wed as the song ends enter colonel calverley 
Major Murgatroyd, and the other officers in uniform as from parade. The ladies groan. So do the babies. Hello, groans? What's this all about? If you only knew how it pains us to see you in those preposterous clothes. Preposterous? Perfectly preposterous. You know they are. If by preposterous you mean not conspicuously well adapted for active service, we cannot deny it. Of course you can't. Your uniforms are useless and pretentious. To the educated eye, they are not even beautiful. Officers horrified. Not, not beautiful? beautiful? Certainly not. If they were, you would not be so unwilling to be seen about in them. Colonel haughtily. It is not etiquette in the British Army for an officer ever to be seen in his uniform. It isn't done. And why not? Because he is ashamed of it. He wants to be dressed like a soldier, not like a mountebank. How can anyone respect a uniform that's only meant for show? That's true. But the ladies, if it wasn't for our gorgeous frippery, they wouldn't fall in love with us. Angela Crossley. Nonsense! Women like soldiers because they are brave, not because they wear red coats. Any Tommy could tell you that. Colonel sarcastically. Indeed? Yes. Saffer, tell Colonel Calverley the story of William Stokes. Saphir sings. Once William Stokes went forth to woo. A corporal he of the horse guards blew. He thought all housemaids' hearts to storm with his truly magnificent uniform. But the housemaids all cried, No, no, no. Your uniform's only meant for show. Your gorgeous trappings are wicked waste. And your whole get-ups in the worst of taste. The, the worst, worst of taste. taste? The worst of taste. These quite unfeeling, very plain dealing, ladies cried in haste, your uniform, Billy, is simply silly, and quite in the worst of taste. Poor William took these cries amiss, being quite unaccustomed to snubs like this. At last he explained by way of excuse, his gorgeous clothes weren't made for use. His elaborate tunic was much too tight to eat his dinner in, far less to fight. It was only meant to attract the eye of the less intelligent passer-by. The, the passer-by? Passer the passer-by. And so poor Billy, feeling quite silly, threw up the horse guards blue, and now in the park he appears in khaki, and greatly prefers it too. That's all very well, and I dare say you're right in what you say, but you'll never get the war office to see it. They're too stupid. Was it the war office who sent us to Aldershot? Yes. You're quite right. They are stupid. What's the matter with Aldershot? It's dull. It's Philistine. It's conventional. And to think that we were once aesthetic. Officers mockingly. Oh, oh South, South Kensington. Kensington. Angela angrily. Not South Kensington. Chelsea, if you knew anything at all, you'd know that South Kensington is quite over now. People of culture have all moved to Chelsea. Why on earth don't you all get promoted to snug berths in the horse guards? Then we could live in London. Colonel, sadly. Do you know how promotion is got in the British Army? No. Listen, and I will tell you. Sings. When you once have your commission, if you want a high position in the army of the king, you must tout for the affections of the influential sections of the inner social ring. If you're anxious for promotion, you must early get a notion of the qualities commander's prize. You must learn to play at polo, strum a banjo, sing a solo, and you're simply bound to rise. For everyone will say, in the usual fatuous way, if this young fellow's such a popular figure in high society, why, what a very competent commander of a troop this fine young man must be. You must buy expensive suits, wear the shiniest of boots, and a glossy hat and tall. For if you're really clever, you need practically never wear your uniform at all. 
you probably will then see as little of your men as you decently can do and you'll launch a thousand sneers at those foolish volunteers who are not a bit like you and those volunteers will say when you go on in that way if this young man's such an unconcealed contempt for the likes of such as we what a genius at strategy and tactics too this fine young man must be when your blunders never noted you are rapidly promoted to the snuggest berth you know till we see you in pell-mell with the army gone to uh, well where the army should not go when your country goes to war your abilities will awe all the foemen that beset her and if you make a mess of it of course we'll told the less of it the country hears the better and you'll hear civilians say in their usual humble way if this old buffer is a general of divisions and also a g c b why what a past master of the art of war this fine old boy must be do you mean that you'll never get berths at the horse guards any of you colonel sadly it's most unlikely then my patience is exhausted i shall apply for a judicial separation so shall i we, we shall, shall all apply, apply for judicial, judicial separations, separations impossible oh yes we shall we cannot consent to remain at aldershot any longer at any moment a new movement in the world of art or letters may begin in london and we shall not be in it the thought is unendurable we must go and pack at once exeunt curtain end of out of patience or bumthorn avenged The Third Mrs. Tankery from Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels by St. John Hankin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Second Mrs. Tankery. After the Second Mrs. Tankery killed herself at the end of the play which bears her name, it might be supposed that her husband would be content with his two successive failures in matrimony and not attempt a third but aubrey as his second marriage shows was nothing if not courageous in matrimonial affairs and we have therefore every reason to believe that he did marry again while we have small ground for hoping that he chose his third wife with any greater wisdom than he chose the other two that is the impression conveyed in the following pathetic scene. Dramatis Personae Aubrey Tanqueray Read by Capricia Page Cayley Drummle Read by Todd Butler Read by Lambda Footman Read by Charlotte Duckett Narrated by Elizabeth Clett The Third Mrs. Tanqueray Scene the dining-room of Aubrey Tanqueray's country house, Hirecombe in Surrey. A lean butler is standing at the sideboard. Aubrey and Cayley Drummle enter and go up to warm themselves at the fire, which burns feebly. The time is an evening in March, five years after the events of Mr. Pinero's play, and Cayley looks quite five years stouter. Aubrey does not. It's quite shocking, Aubrey that you should have been married nearly a year and that i should not yet have had the pleasure of making mrs tanqueray's acquaintance i am dying to know her my fault my dear cayley entirely your weddings are always so furtive pokes the fire resolutely in the hope of producing something approaching a cheerful blaze well you'll see her to-night i hoped she would be able to dine at home but she had promised to address a temperance meeting in the village Cayley looks dubious. However, she'll be back at ten. Meanwhile, you'll have to be contented with a bachelor dinner. They go to the table and sit down. Cayley, unfolding serviette. Experience has taught me, my dear Aubrey, that bachelor dinners are apt to be particularly well worth eating. No doubt it is to make up for the absence of more charming society. Aubrey, doubtfully. I hope it will prove so in this case i am sure of it i remember your cook of old i'm afraid it won't be that cook 
Cayley, in horror. You haven't parted with him? Yes. He left soon after my marriage. There was some small error in his accounts, which Mrs. Tankery discovered. So, of course, he had to be dismissed. Cayley, eagerly. Do you happen to have his address? I dare say Mrs. Tanqueray has, if you wish to know it. Footman hands soup. I shall be eternally indebted to her. Why? I shall engage him at once. Begins to eat his soup, frowns, and then puts down his spoon. But I'm afraid you'll want him back yourself. No. My wife is most particular about the character of her servants. Ah. I'm more particular about the character of my soup. His hand goes out instinctively towards his sherry glass. As he is about to raise it, he sees that it is empty and refrains. Cayley, you ought to marry. Then you'd realize there are more important things in the world than soap. Of course there are, my dear fellow. There's the fish and the joint. Fish of an unattractive kind is handed to him. He takes some. Cyberite. Cayley looks at his fish dubiously, then leaves it untasted. You are quite wrong. A simple cut of beef or mutton, well cooked, is quite enough for me. Butler, to Cayley. Lemonade, sir. Er, what? No, thank you. Ah, oh, Cayley, what will you drink? Cayley's face brightens visibly. I'm afraid I can't offer you any wine. It falls again. My wife never allows alcohol at her table. But there are various sorts of mineral waters. You don't mind? Cayley, grimly. Not at all, my dear fellow, not at all. Which brand of mineral water do you consider most, uh, stimulating? Aubrey, laughing mirthlessly. <laughs> I'm afraid, Cayley, you're not a convert to temperance principles yet. That shows you have never heard my wife speak. Cayley, emphatically. Never. Temperance meetings are not in my line. Footman removes his plate. Perhaps some of the other movements in which she is interested would appeal to you more. With a touch of happy pride. As you may know, my wife is a vice-president of the Anti-Vaccination Society, and of the Women's Home Rule Union. Indeed, she is in great request on all public platforms. Cayley, with simulated enthusiasm. I feel sure of that, my dear Aubrey. Footman hands Cayley some rice pudding. Cayley puts up his eyeglass and eyes it curiously. What is this? Rice pudding, sir. Cayley drops a spoon hastily. Aubrey, politely. You're eating nothing, Cayley. Cayley, with some concern. Aubrey, have I slept through the joint? I have no recollection of eating it. If... In a moment of abstraction, I refused it. May I change my mind? Aubrey, sternly. My wife never has meat on her table on Fridays. Cayley, peevishly. My dear fellow, I wish you'd thought of mentioning it before I came down. Then I might have had a more substantial luncheon. Where's that rice pudding? Helps himself. There is rather a constrained silence. It's really very good of you to have come down to see us, Cayley. Cayley, pulling himself together. Very good of you to say so, my dear chap. Tackles his rice pudding manfully. My wife and I can so seldom get any man to drop in to dinner nowadays. Cayley, giving up his struggle with rice pudding in despair. I suppose so. In fact, we see very little society now. Cayley, sententiously. Society only likes people who feed it, my dear Aubrey. You ought to have kept that cook. Aubrey meditatively so my daughter says elaine is she with you now no she is in ireland after making that remark she went back to her convent cayley heartily sensible girl i like elaine no she and my wife did not get on somehow it was very unfortunate as it was mainly on elaine's account that i thought it right to marry again cayley with polite incredulity Indeed. Yes. You see, it is so difficult for a girl of Elaine's retiring disposition to meet people and make friends when she has no mother to chaperone her. And if she meets no one, how can she get married? Dessert, Cayley? Cayley, 
after surveying a rather unattractive assortment of apples and walnuts. No, thanks. As you were saying? So I thought if I could meet with a really suitable person, someone with whom she would be in sympathy, someone she would look upon as a sort of second mother. Cayley, correcting him. Third, Aubrey. Aubrey, ignoring the interruption. It would make home more comfortable for her. Cayley, laughing. <laughs> I like your idea of comfort, Aubrey. But I should have thought you could have adopted some less extreme measures for providing Elaine with a chaperone. You have neighbors. Mrs. Cordelion, for instance. Aubrey, stiffly. Mrs. Cordelion's chaperone was not very successful on the last occasion. No, no, to be sure. Young Ardale. I was forgetting. Unhappily, the whole scheme was a failure. Elaine conceived a violent aversion for Mrs. Tanqueray almost directly we came home, and a week later I remember it was directly after dinner. She announced her intention of leaving the house for ever. Cayley, the thought of his dinner still rankling. Poor girl. No doubt she's happier in her convent. Butler enters with coffee. Cayley takes some. I am sorry I can't ask you to smoke, Cayley, but my wife has a particular objection to tobacco. She is a member of the Anti-Tobacco League and often speaks at its meetings. Cayley, annoyed. Really, my dear fellow, if I may neither eat, drink, nor smoke, I don't quite see why you asked me down. Aubrey, penitently. I suppose I ought to have thought of that. The fact is, I have got so used to these little deprivations that now I hardly notice them. Of course it's different for you. I should think it was. Aubrey, relenting. If you very much want to smoke, I dare say it might be managed. If we have this window wide open and you sit by it, a cigarette might not be noticed. Cayley, shortly. Thanks. Takes out cigarette and lights it, as soon as Aubrey has made the elaborate arrangements indicated above. Aubrey, politely. I hope you won't find it cold. Cayley, grimly. England in March is always cold. <laughs> Sneezes violently. But perhaps, if you ring for my overcoat, I may manage to survive the evening. Certainly. What is it like? I've no idea. It's an ordinary sort of coat. Your man will know it if you ring for him. Aubrey, hesitating. I'd rather fetch it for you myself, if you don't mind. I should not like Parks to see that you were smoking. It would set such a bad example. Cayley throwing his cigarette on to the lawn in a rage and closing the window with a shiver. Don't trouble. I'll smoke in the train. By the way, what time is my train? Your train? Yes. I must get back to town, my dear fellow. Nonsense. You said you'd stay a week. Did I? Then I didn't know what I was saying. I must get back tonight. But you brought a bag. Only to dress, Aubrey. By the way, will you tell your man to pack it? You can't go tonight. The last train leaves at 9.30. It's 9.15 now. Cayley, jumping up. Then I must start at once. Send my bag after me. You've not a chance of catching it. Cayley, solemnly. My dear old friend, I shall return to town tonight if I have to walk. Aubrey, detaining him. But my wife, you haven't even made her acquaintance yet. She'll think it so strange. Not half so strange as I have thought her dinner. Shaking himself free. No, Aubrey, this is really goodbye. I like you very much, and it cuts me to the heart to have to drop your acquaintance, but nothing in the world would induce me to face another dinner such as I have had tonight. Cayley. Cayley, making for the door. And nothing in the world would induce me to be introduced to the third Mrs. Tanqueray. Exit hurriedly. Curtain. End of the Third Mrs. Tanqueray The Lady on the Sea From Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels by St. John Hankin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Lady from the Sea when Ibsen ended The Lady from the Sea by making Mrs. Wangle give up her idea of eloping with the stranger, 
and decide to remain with her husband and her stepchildren, many people must have felt that there was a want of finality about the arrangement. Having discussed so exhaustively with Dr. Wangle the advisability of leaving him, she could hardly be expected to give up the project permanently. The play is therefore one which emphatically calls for a sequel. Dramatis Personae Boletta, performed by Sarah O'Connor Hilda, performed by Karen Savage Mrs. Wangle, performed by Sarah O'Connor Dr. Wangle, by Peter Yearsley A Steward, performed by Karen Savage Brown, performed by Peter Yearsley The Lady on the Sea Scene 1 Beside the pond in the Wangle's garden It is a malarious evening in September Hilda and Belletta, Mrs. Wangle's stepdaughters, are, as usual, failing to catch the carp which are said to haunt the pond. Do you think she, nodding towards Mrs. Wangle, who prowls to and fro on the damp lawn with a shawl over her head, is any better? No, worse. Oh, she can't be worse. That's all very well for you. You're going to be married. It doesn't matter to you how mad she is. You'll be out of it before long. Yes, I shall be out of it. But I shan't. However, perhaps she'll go away soon. Papa still thinks of moving to the seaside, then. Oh, Papa! Papa never thinks. Hush, Hilda, what dreadful things you say. Not half so dreadful as the things I should like to do. Hilda! Oh, yes, I should. And I will when I grow up. I'll make Master Builder Sons tumble off one of his own steeples. Think of that now. What a horrid child you are, and just when I thought you were beginning to get on better with her, too. Nodding toward Mrs. Wangle. It's most provoking. I call it perfectly thrilling myself, but here she comes. Mrs. Wangle approaches. Go away. I want to talk to her. Exit Belletta, doubtfully. How are you today, Mother? Eh? I asked you how you were. But you called me Mother. I'm not your mother. I'm only your stepmother. But I can't address you as stepmother. People don't do those things, as dear Hedda Gabler always says. Mrs. Wangle, whose attention is clearly wandering. I suppose they don't. Mother, have you seen him? I believe Wangle is in the surgery. I don't mean Papa. What does it matter where Papa is? I mean the stranger. The English steamer is at the pier. It arrived last night. She looks at Mrs. Wangle meaningfully. Is it, dear? You astonish me. You will go and see him, won't you? Oh, of course, of course. I think it must be so perfectly thrilling to go down all by oneself to a steamer to see a strange man who is not one's husband. Mrs. Wangle, recalling with difficulty her old phrase. Oh, yes, yes. It allures me wonderfully. I should go at once if I were you, before Papa comes out. Don't you think I ought to tell Wangle? I have always been accustomed to consult him before eloping with anyone else. I think not. You must go of your own free will. You see, Papa might urge you to go, and then it would not be altogether your own will that sent you, would it? It would be partly his. So it would. Isn't it splendid to think of your going away with him tonight, quite, quite away, across the sea? Er, uh, yes. You know you always like the sea. You talk so much about it. It allures you, you know. Yes, the idea of it is wonderfully alluring, but I've never been on the sea. That's what makes the idea so thrilling. It will be quite a new sensation. The sea is so fresh and buoyant, you know, so rough. Not like these vapid fjords where it's always calm, quite different altogether. Ah, oh, there's Wangle. Enter Dr. Wangle. Bother. She returns to her fishing for the carp, which are never caught. Ah, Elida, is that you? Yes, Wangle. Not brooding, I trust, dear? Not letting your mind dwell on the stranger, eh? Mrs. Wangle, always ready to adopt an idea from any quarter, 
Of course, Wangle, I never can quite get the idea of the stranger out of my mind. Dr. Wangle, shaking his head. Silly girl, silly girl. And the sea, too? Still full of the sea? Ah, the sea, the wonderful, changeful sea, so fresh and buoyant, you know, so rough, not like these vapid fjords. I had a child whose eyes were like the sea. I assure you, Elida, you are wrong. The child's eyes were just like other children's eyes. All children's eyes are. Hilda suppresses a slight giggle. Wangle notices her for the first time. Fishing, Hilda? Yes, Papa. Trying to hook a silly old carp. I think I shall catch her in the end. What bait do you use? Oh, I have been very careful about the bait. My fish rose to it at once. Well, well, I must go back to the surgery. Goodbye, Alida, and mind, no brooding about the sea. Oh, the sea, the sea. Yes, you'll be on it soon. Won't it be thrilling? I really think you ought to start at once. I suppose I ought to pack a few things first. I wouldn't mind about that if I were you. I'd go down to the ship just as I was, slip on board without being noticed, and hide until I was well outside the fjord and began to feel the real sea heaving under me. Shall I like that? Of course you will. It's your native element, you know. You always said so. Before you've been on it half an hour, you'll wish you were overboard. You'll like the sea so. Mrs. Wangle, fired by this vicarious enthusiasm. I shall. I know I shall. He will be there too, and he's so frightfully alluring. I must go at once. Exit hurriedly by the garden gate. Caught by Jove! My fish caught! She'll go off with her second mate on the English steamer and never come back any more. What a triumph for my bait! Picks up fishing tackle and exit into the house in high good humour. Scene 2 the deck of the English steamer. The vessel has got outside the shelter of the fjord and is beginning to pitch a little in the long sea rollers. Mrs. Wangle is discovered groping her way cautiously up the companion in the darkness. This motion is very disagreeable. The vessel gives a very heavy lurch. Most disagreeable. I wonder if I could speak to the stranger now. Hilda said I ought to wait till we were out at sea. Oh! The vessel gives another lurch. Did you call? No, uh, th that is, yes. Will you send Mr. Johnston to me? There's no one of that name among the passengers, madam. Mr. Johnston isn't a passenger. Mr. Johnston is the second mate. The vessel lurches again. Oh, oh! Steward, looking suspiciously at her, but the second mate's name is Brown. Another alias. <gasps> it's the same person. Will you ask him to come to me? Very well, madam. Queer that. Wants to see the second mate and don't remember his name. But there, what can you expect on these excursion steamers? He exits. Mrs. Wangle, as the boat gets further out to sea and begins to roll heavily. This is horrible. I begin to think I don't like the sea at all. I feel positively ill. And I always thought the motion would be so exhilarating. It doesn't exhilarate me in the least. I wish Johnston would come. Or Brown. I mean Brown. Perhaps he could find somewhere for me to lie down. Brown or Johnston, accompanied by the steward, comes up the hatchway. He is the same disreputable-looking seaman whose acquaintance the reader of the lady from the sea, has already made. This is the lady. Indicating Mrs. Wangle. Brown, in his most nautical manner, I know that, you swab. Haven't I eyes? Get out. Exit steward. Well, woman, what do you want? Mrs. Wangle, faintly, too much overcome by the rolling of the vessel to resent his roughness. I... I have come to you. So I see. Don't you want me, Alfred? My name isn't Alfred. It's John. It used to be Alfred. Well, now it's John. Are you 
Glad to see me. Not a bit. Never was so sorry to see a woman in my life. But you came for me. You said you wanted me. I know I did. Thought old Quangle Wangle would buy me off if I put the screw on. He didn't see it. Stingy old cuss. Mrs. Wangle, appalled at this way of speaking of her husband. But you never asked Dr. Wangle for anything. No fear. Too old a hand for that. He'd have put me in prison for trying to extort money. How could you expect him to give you money if you didn't ask for it? I didn't suppose he was an absolute fool. When a man has a crazy wife, he can't be such a born naturalist to suppose that another man really wants her to go away with him. He wants the price of a drink. That's what he wants. But old Quangle Wangle is too clever for me. He wouldn't part. Wouldn't part husband and wife, you mean? No, I don't, and you know I don't. Wouldn't part with the dibs, that's what I mean. Mrs. Wangle, as the vessel gives a big roll. Oh, I'm going to be very ill indeed. Why did I think I should like the sea? Why indeed, I don't know. Dash me if I do. Mad, I suppose. What am I to do now? Go back to old Quangle if he'll take you. He's fool enough, I dare say. But I can't. We're out at sea. I can't get back now. I think I'm going to die. She sinks upon a seat. Die? You won't die. No such luck. You're going to be seasick, you are. Where's your cabin? I don't know. Where's your luggage? Hand me over your keys. I haven't any luggage. Built again, so help me. Not so much of a half-sovereign on you, I suppose. Mrs. Wangle, feeling limply in her pocket. No, I must have left my purse at home. Well, I'm... He looks sourly at her. What are you going to do with me? Do with you? Send you back to Quangle by the first steamer, of course. You'll have to work your passage back as stewardess. Heaven help the passengers. He stalks to the hatchway and disappears. Mrs. Wangle, with a groan, resigns herself to seasickness. The End of The Lady on the Sea Octavian and Cleopatra From Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels by Sinjin Hankin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Caesar and Cleopatra It might have been thought that Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, rather than Mr. Bernard Shaw's Caesar and Cleopatra, demanded a dramatic sequel. But, as Mr. Shaw has pointed out repeatedly that he is the greater dramatist of the two, his play has been chosen in preference to Shakespeare's. A prefatory essay proving, at great length, the dialogue of the sequel is true to life and is in fact substantially a reproduction of what was spoken in the year B.C. 31 has been omitted for lack of space. Octavian and Cleopatra Dramatis Personae Cleopatra Read by Avai. Charmian. Read by Libby Gone. Octavian. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Agrippa. Read by Alan Mapstone. Narrated by Lambda. Scene. An extravagantly furnished apartment in the palace at Alexandria. Cleopatra is discovered seated upon her throne. She is dressed with mournful splendor, as befits a queen who has been defeated at Actium and has suffered a recent bereavement. Her face is as attractive as liberal use of cosmetics can make it, and her whole appearance is that of a middle-aged and rather dissipated member of Cop the Ballet, who has gone into half-mourning because the manager has reduced her salary. Charmian, a pretty, shrewish-looking dancer, is in attendance on her. Am I looking my best, Charmian? Your Majesty is looking as well as I can make you. If you are not satisfied, you had better get another maid. Looking at herself in hand mirror. Mm, silly child, of course I am satisfied. I think you are wonderful. Yes, I think I've not done so badly. Of course, with Antony not even buried yet, it would hardly have done for me to be too magnificent most unsuitable 
as it is i think we've arrived at a rather successful blend of splendour and sorrow suggesting at once the afflicted widow and the queen who is open to consolation that is certainly the impression we intended to convey by the way when does caesar arrive octavian almost at once his first visit isn't it yes so much depends on a first impression looks at mirror again i think we shall captivate him he is not very impressionable i hear no but i shall manage think how completely i fascinated julius his uncle i'm afraid that's hardly a reason why you should prove equally attractive to the nephew my dear child why not well the lapse of time you know that was seventeen years ago so long hmm, i am really very well preserved considering the wear and tear my good charmian how crudely you put things i declare i've a good mind to have you executed your majesty will hardly do that i am the only person in egypt who really understands the secret of your majesty's complexion mm, that's true but you ought to be more tactful tossing her head you can't expect me to display tact when my wages haven't been paid since the battle of actium poor child never mind when octavian is at my feet you shall be paid in full will that satisfy you i'd much rather have something on account i wish you wouldn't vex me in this way just when it's so important that i should look my best you know how unbecoming temper is to a woman when she is well over thirty beginning to cry there there i'm sorry i said anything to hurt you don't cry for heaven's sake or that rouge will run then i shall have to go all over you again dry your eyes there's a good creature cleopatra does so obediently i declare you're all in streaks come here and let me put you straight cleopatra goes to charmian who produces powder puff etc and repasts the ravages of emotion quick quick they're coming i hear them ah oh, i'm glad he's so early only a quarter of an hour after his time that shows how eager he is to see me i feel that this is going to be another of my triumphs charmian puts the finishing touch to the queen just as caesar enters she then hastily conceals powder puff etc behind her cleopatra has no time to return to the throne and stands rather awkwardly with charmian to receive her visitors these prove to be octavian a pale dyspeptic looking young man of about thirty agrippa a bluff thick-set red-faced warrior past middle age and a guard of roman soldiers looking around the gorgeous apartment with much disgust and speaking in a soft weary voice Ugh, bad taste very bad taste all this you know what these barbarians are to the two women kindly inform the queen caesar is here advancing i am the queen how do you do you nonsense oh yes i am the gentle melancholy dear dear another illusion gone illusion your beauty you know your grace your charm i had heard so much of them so had agrippa let me introduce you by the way agrippa cleopatra as i was saying it is most disappointing not what i expected at all charmian giggles furtively you don't admire me admire you oh, my dear lady antony was of a different opinion antony was a fool hush my dear agrippa you hurt her feelings agrippa shrugs his shoulders and crosses to charmian with whom he begins a vigorous flirtation never mind my feelings 
"'Frankly, then, dear lady, we are not impressed. We came here prepared for a beautiful temptress, a dazzling siren whom I must resist or perish, something seductive, enticing. And what do we find?' "'Well, what do you find?' in his gentlest voice dear lady don't let us pursue this painful subject probably we had not allowed for the flight of time suffice it that our poor hopes are unrealized looking round but i don't see caesarian my son is not here another disappointment you wish to speak to him yes they talk of him as a son of julius don't they he is a son of julius a sort of relation of mine then i must really make his acquaintance can you give me his address no if you want him you will have to find him for yourself i shall find him dearest queen you need be under no apprehensions about that brute eh nothing i was only thinking never think aloud dear lady it's a dangerous habit is there anything further you want with me nothing thank you nothing at least nothing just now you would like to see me later gentler than a sucking dove in a few weeks perhaps the triumph you know the sovereign people throwing up their caps and hallooing the procession up the sacred way with the headsman at the end of it all oh, oh, the usual thing losing her temper oh you're not a man at all you're a block a stone you have no blood in your veins you're not like antony no dear lady i'm not like antony if i were i shouldn't have beaten him at actium i won't stay to be baited in this way i won't i won't goes towards door farewell then we shall meet again agrippa the queen is going breaking off in the midst of his flirtation eh oh uh good boy stamping her foot charmian charmian jumps up kisses her hand to agrippa and follows her mistress out looking after her that's a pretty little binx octavian who has seated himself wearily on the throne is she i didn't notice caesarian's fled so i supposed it's a great nuisance we must find him will you see about it if you wish it what shall i do with him in his tired voice better put him to death it will save a lot of trouble in the end but the boy's your own cousin yes i have always disliked my relations i begin to think you are a genius caesar after all i am much good it does me i'd give my genius for your digestion any day leans back on throne and closes his eyes enter charmian hurriedly looking pale and dishevelled help help the queen is dying irritably opening his eyes stop that noise girl you make my headache she is dying i tell you she has taken poison exit squealing poison by jove confound it she must do that must she is about to follow charmian why not it seems to me an excellent arrangement very thoughtful of her very thoughtful and considerate but we want her for that triumph of yours ah oh, never mind after all what is a triumph disagreeable for her a bore for us let her die now by all means if she prefers it don't you try to be magnanimous too leave that to your uncle he did it better my dear agrippa how stupid you are what possible use can a quite plain and middle-aged lady be in a triumphal procession if cleopatra were still attractive i should say save her by all means as she isn't oh, oh i think we may let her die her own way without being charged with excessive magnanimity still i should have liked to have seen her brought to rome ah i shall be quite contented to see her comfortably in her coffin in egypt we'll let her be buried beside antony it will gratify the egyptians and it won't hurt us 
See to it, there's a good fellow. Exit Agrippa. Octavian leans back and falls asleep on the throne. End of Octavian and Cleopatra. The Unfortunate Mr. Ebsmith from Mr. Punch's Dramatic Sequels by St. John Henkin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Notorious Mrs. Ebsmith those persons who have seen Mrs. Patrick Campbell's magnificent performance in The Notorious Mrs. Ebsmith will have probably gone away with a quite false impression of the gentleman with whom Agnes Ebsmith spent her eight years of married life. For the first twelve months, she declares bitterly in the first act, he treated me like a woman in a harem, for the rest of the time like a beast of burden. This is not quite just to poor Ebsmith, who was a good sort of fellow in his commonplace way, and it is manifestly unfair that the audience should have no opportunity of hearing his side of the question. An attempt is made to remedy this injustice in the following prologue, which all fair-minded persons are entreated to read before seeing Mr. Pinero's very clever play. The Unfortunate Mr. Ebsmith Dramatis Personae Mr. Ebsmith Read by Bala Agnes Ebsmith Read by Capricia Page. Narration by Todd. Scene. The dining room of the Ebsmith's house in West Kensington. Agnes and her husband are at breakfast. They have been married seven years. She looks much as we see her in the early acts of the play. Gaunt, pale, badly dressed. He is a careworn man with hair slightly gray at the temples, an anxious forehead, and sad eyes. He is glancing through the standard in the intervals of eating his bacon. She is absorbed in the morning screamer, one of the more violent socialist radical organs of that day. Presently, Eb Smith looks up. You won't forget, Agnes, that we are expecting people to dinner tonight? Agnes, putting down her paper with an air of patient endurance. Ah? Uh? Eb Smith, mildly. I was saying, dear, if you will give me your attention for a moment, that I hope you would not forget that Sir Miles Jawkins and his wife and the Spencers and the Thorntons were dining here tonight. Agnes, contemptuously. You seem very anxious that I should remember that Lady Jawkins is honouring us with her company. I only meant that I hoped you had told Jane about dinner. Last time the Jawkinses came, you may recollect, that you had omitted to order anything for them to eat and when they arrived there was nothing in the house but some soup a little cold mutton and a rice pudding very well returns to her paper thank you and agnes if you could manage to be dressed in time to receive them i should be very much obliged i of course i suppose you will be here to entertain our guests your guests you mean my dear agnes surely my guests are your guests also agnes breaking out as long as the present unjust and oppressive marriage laws remain in force ebsmith interrupting i don't think we need to go into the question of the alteration of the marriage laws ah oh, yes you always refuse to listen to my arguments on that subject you know they are unanswerable ebsmith patiently i only meant that there would hardly be time to discuss the matter at breakfast agnes vehemently a paltry evasion still i assume that you will be here to receive our guests my guests if you prefer it to-night do you make a point of always being at home to receive my guests those anarchist people whom you are constantly asking to tea certainly not agnes with triumphant logic then may i ask you why i should be at home to receive the jawkinses my dear you surely realize that the cases are hardly parallel the only time i was present at one of your revolutionary tea parties the guest consisted of a hyde park orator who dropped his hedges a cobbler who had turned socialist by the way of increasing his importance in the eyes of the community 
three ladies who were either living apart from their husbands or living with the husbands of other ladies and a polish refugee who had been convicted quite justly of murder you cannot pretend to compare the jockinses with such people indeed i can rhetorically in a properly organized society ebb smith testily i really can't stop to reorganize society now i'm due at my chambers in half an hour agnes sullenly as you decline to listen to what i have to say i may as well tell you at once that i shall not be at home to dinner to-night ebb smith controlling his temper with an effort may i ask your reason because i have to be at the meeting of the anti-marriage association can't you send an excuse send an excuse throw up a meeting called to discuss an important public question because you have asked a few barristers and their wives to dine you must be mad well i must put them off i suppose what night next week will suit you to meet them thursday on thursday i am addressing a meeting of the society for the encouragement of divorce friday agnes coldly friday as you know is the weekly meeting of the agamist league saturday on saturday i am speaking on free union for the people of battersea can you suggest an evening agnes firmly no i think the time has come to make a stand against the convention which demands that a wife should preside at her husband's dinner parties it is an absurdity away with it ebb smith alarmed but agnes think what you are doing you don't want to offend these people spencer and thornton are useful men to know and jockins puts a lot of work in my way agnes with magnificent scorn how like a man and so i am to be civil with this jawkins person because he puts a lot of work in your way ebb smith meekly well you know my dear i have to make an income somehow i would sooner starve than resort to such truckling ebb smith gloomily we are likely to do that sooner or later in any case what do you mean ebb smith diffidently your ahem somewhat subversive tenets my love are not precisely calculated to improve my professional prospects what have i to do with your prospects the accounts of your meetings which appear in the newspapers are not likely to encourage respectable solicitors to send me briefs agnes indifferently indeed here is a report in today's standard of a meeting addressed by you last night which would certainly not have that effect shall i read it to you if you wish ebb smith reads the meeting which was held in st luke's parish last night under the auspices of the polyandrous club proved to be of an unusually exciting description the lecturer was mrs john ebb smith wife of the well-known barrister of that name breaking off really agnes i think my name need not have been dragged into the business go on as soon as the doors were opened the place of meeting the iron hall carter street was filled with a compact body of roughs assembled from the neighboring streets and there seemed every prospect of disorderly scenes the appearance of mrs ebb smith on the platform was greeted with cheers and cries of mad agnes surely my dear you must recognize that my professional reputation is endangered when my wife was reported in the newspapers as addressing meetings in discreditable parts of london where her appearance is greeted with shouts of mad agnes nonsense who is likely to read an obscure paragraph like that obscure paragraph my dear agnes the standard has a leading article on it listen to this mrs ebb smith's crusade against the institution of marriage is again attracting unfavorable attention last night in st luke's she once more attempted to ventilate her preposterous schemes crack-brained crusade bellowing revolutionary nonsense on obscure platforms this absurd visionary whom her audiences not inappropriately nicknamed mad agnes ultimately the meeting had to be broken up by the police we cannot understand how a man in mr ebb smith's position can allow himself to be made ridiculous almost weeping 
i do think they might leave my name out of it in a leading article too is there any more of the stuff another half column do my dear to oblige me find some less ostentatious method of making known your views on the subject of marriage agnes anticipating a remark subsequently made by the duke of st alfred's unostentatious immodesty is not part of my programme ebbsmith humbly could you not for my sake consent to take a less prominent part in the movement agnes enthusiastically but i want to be among the leaders the leaders that will be my hour ebbsmith puzzled your hour i don't think i quite understand you there is only one hour in a woman's life when she is defying her husband wrecking his happiness and blasting his prospects that is her hour let her make the most of every second of it ebbsmith wearily well my dear when it's over you will have the satisfaction of counting the departing footsteps of a ruined man departing certainly you and your crusade between them will have killed me but i must go now i ought to be at my chambers in ten minutes and i must go around and make excuses to jawkins some time this morning tell jane not to bother about dinner to-night i shall dine at the club exit curtain end of the unfortunate mr ebbsmith omar and oh my from mr punch's dramatic sequels by st john hankin this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam When it was announced recently in an English daily paper that a drama founded upon Fitzgerald's version of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam had been compounded in the United States and would shortly be seen on the stage, many people may have wondered how it was done it was done as follows dramatis personae lion read by loveday lizard read by emily jones wild ass read by elizabeth clatt omar read by algie pug crowd read by bev stevens nightingale read by karen savage rose read by charlotte duckett saki read by bev stevens first pot read by ruth golding second pot read by elizabeth clatt third pot read by charlotte duckett fourth pot read by alan mapstone potter read by capricia page narrator read by ruth golding scene courtyard of the deserted palace of jamshid canopied by that inverted bowl commonly called the sky to right a tavern not deserted to left a potter's house at back the grave of bahram whence a sound of snoring proceeds a wild ass stamps fitfully upon it it is four o'clock in the morning and the false dawn shows in the sky in the centre of the stage stand a lion and a lizard eyeing each other mistrustfully look here do you keep these courts or do i lizard resentfully i don't know i believe we both keep them lion sarcastically do you then i venture to differ from you perhaps you rather we took turns oh no i wouldn't i mean to have this job to myself he and the lizard close in mortal combat after a gallant struggle the latter is killed and the lion proceeds to eat him suddenly a shadowy form issues from the grave at back of stage bahram by jove confound that jackass bolts remains of lizard and then bolts himself pursued by shadowy form they said i couldn't wake him but i knew better 
exit in triumph a sound in revelry becomes noticeable from the tavern a crowd gathers outside the voice of omar rather tipsy is heard when all the temple <gasps> is prepared within my nods a lousy worshipper outside a cock crows and the sun rises crowd shouting in unison open then the door you know how little while we have to stay and once departed goodness only knows when we shall get back again opening the door and appearing unsteadily on the threshold you can't come in it's <gasps> full closes door again i say what rot exeunt depressed nightingale jubilantly from tree wine wine red wine rose from neighbouring bush much shocked my dear you don't know how your passion for alcohol shocks me oh yes i do but every morning brings a thousand roses after all you're cheap jamshid and i like our liquor and plenty of it shaking her head in disapproval i heard he drank deep of course he did you should have seen him when hatim called to supper he simply went for it blushing crimson how dreadful contemptuously i dare say but you wouldn't be so red yourself if some buried caesar didn't fertilize your roots why even the hyacinth's past isn't altogether creditable and as for the grass why i could tell you things about the grass that would scare the soul out of a vegetable annoyed i'm not a vegetable well well i can't stay to argue with you i've but a little time to flutter myself exit on the wing enter omar from tavern he is by this time magnificently intoxicated and is leaning on the arm of a fascinating saki he has a jug of wine in his hand trying to kiss her ah my beloved fill the cup the clears to-day of past regrets and future fears to-morrow why to-morrow i may be interrupting i know what you're going to say to-morrow you'll be sober but you won't i know you go home home <gasps> what do i want with home a book of verses underneath the bow a jug of wine a loaf of bread no no bread two jugs of wine and thou puts arm round her waist beside me singing like a bulbul sings uproariously well tonight will merry be for tonight <gasps> fie an old man like you old thank goodness i am old when i was young i went to school and heard the sages didn't learn much there they said i came like water and went like wind horrid chilly band of hope sort of doctrine i know better now drinks from the jug in his hand <coughs> watching him anxiously take care you'll spill it never mind it won't be wasted all goes to quench some poor beggar's thirst down there points below dare say he needs it <coughs> shocked how can you talk so growing argumentative in his cups i must abjure the balm of life i must i must give up wine for fear of her what is it i'm to fear gout i suppose not i takes another drink trying to take jug from him there there you've had enough fast losing coherence in his extreme intoxication i want to talk to you about thee and me that's what i want to talk about counting on his fingers you see there's the thee in me and there's a me in thee that's mysticism that is difficult word to say mysticism must light lamp and see if i can't find it must be somewhere about you're drunk that's what you are disgracefully drunk 
of course i'm drunk i am to-day what i was yesterday and to-morrow i shall not be less kiss me boxing his ears i won't have it i tell you i'm a respectable saki and you are not to take liberties or i'll leave you to find your way home alone becoming maudlin don't leave me my rose my bullfinch i mean bull bull you know how my road is beset with pitfall <coughs> and with gin disgusted plenty of gin i know you never can pass a public house struck with the splendour of the idea i say <coughs> let's fling the dust aside and naked on the air of heaven ride it's shame not to do it flings off hat and stamps on it by way of preliminary scandalized if you take anything else off i shall call the police exit hurriedly terrified here saki come back how am i to find my way without you a pause what's come to the girl i only spoke eh? better forikelly difficult word to say meta forry kelly longer pause how am i to get home can't go alone must wait for someone to come along peers tipsily about him strange isn't it that though lots of people go along here every day not one returns to tell me of the road very strange suppose must sleep here Suppose. rolls into ditch and falls asleep the curtain falls for a moment when it rises again day is departing and it is growing dark omar is still in his ditch the door of the potter's house to the left of the stage is open the potter having betaken himself to the tavern opposite and the pots within are arguing fiercely don't tell me i was only made to be broken i know better even a peevish boy wouldn't break me the potter would whack him if he did third pot of a more ungainly make depends on what he drank out of you what's that you say you lopsided object that's right sneer at me tisn't my fault if the potter's hand shook when he made me he was not sober fourth pot i think a sufi pipkin it's all very well to talk about pot and potter what i want to know is what did the pot call the kettle grumbling i believe my clay's too dry that's the matter with me the moon rises a step is heard without hark, hark there's, there's the potter, potter. can't, can't you, you hear his creaks creaking enter potter from tavern crossly shut up in there or i'll break some of you the pots tremble and are silent seeing omar hello come out of that you're in my ditch lifts him into sitting posture by the collar rubbing his eyes eh? what's that oh my head my head clasps it between his hands get up you've been drinking dazed at his penetration i wonder he guessed that it's plain enough you've been providing your fading life with liquor i can see that with half an eye i have i have i've drowned my glory in a shallow cup and my head's very bad you should take the pledge oh i've sworn to give up drink lots of times doubtfully but was i sober when i swore tell me that scratching his head dunno staggering to his feet would but the desert of the fountain yield one glimpse in more prosaic language could you get me something to drink i'm rather star scattered myself and the grass is wet potter goes to house and takes up third pot at random third pot delighted now he's going to fill me with the old familiar juice potter fills him with water and returns to omar third pot disgusted water well i'm dashed 
Many thanks, Osaki. Here's to you. Drains Beaker. Ugh, don't think much of your liquor. I wish the moon wouldn't look at me like that. She's a beastly colour. Why doesn't she look the other way? Sarcastically. Wants to see you, I suppose. Darkly. Well, some day she won't. That's all. Farewell, Osaki. Yours is a joyous errand. But I wish you had put something stronger in the glass. Handing it back to him. Turn it down. There's a good fellow. Exit. The End End of Omar and Oh My End of Mr Punch's Dramatic Sequels by St. John Hankin